Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crossover. Starring Josh Johnson and Chris McGill. Featuring Christina Thorson. And of course, you, the Instagram live chat. Now, sit back and enjoy this week's edition of The Crossover. Powered by Card Ladder. <laughs> we both got fresh cuts. Let's go. <clears throat> we both got fresh cuts. All right. What did I miss? Did you tell everybody? Tell everybody what? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Your new background, for example. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, we'll get to that very quickly here. So, first of all, welcome to the crossover. Today is August 19th, Friday. Uh, do you have mail days? Yep. Okay, you do have mail days. Okay, let's do that. Let's do mail days. Let's do. Let's let's get these mail days knocked out. It was supposed to come tomorrow, but the hobby gods were looking down on us. Nice. One card mail day, and it is. I haven't told anybody about this yet. Oh, nice man. So this is a 2005, 1952 style reprint, Topps Chrome, uh, Gold Refractor, Chris Paul. So this is actually a rookie card. And these are numbered 25, similar to 06 Topps Chrome. So this is like a tie for the rarest Topps Chrome Gold, and it's a rookie. That's amazing. What a, what a beautiful card. So I had one of these before, and I graded a PSA 10. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, vaguely familiar. I bought a 9.5, cracked it, I got a PSA 10, and then stupidly sold it, and now I got another one. Centering looks good. Yeah, there's like a, like a kind of like a, you see that little line right there? Yeah, I do. I think that might be a 9, but we'll see. Sweet, man. Congrats. Do you have a mail day? No, I have no mail days. Well, I guess I sort of have a mail day. <laughs> Not a card, though. No, that's a card. Uh, so, well, before that, let me just uh, give a plug really quick to the Card Ladder YouTube channel, which has dropped its fifth and final edition of the um, of our national video series uh, created by Stiff Arm Wax. So, episode five is out. It's called uh, Collecting Goats at the 22 National Sports Collectors Convention. So check that out on the Card Letter YouTube channel. That that concludes the five-part series. So, you know, it's, it's basically, it's, I think, in totality, uh, the five parts come out to maybe 60 or 70 minutes. It's, it's basically a documentary about the National. Yep, that's another fantastic video. Okay, and then our Christina in my mail day is moving to two. Some people guessed Phoenix. Some people thought we went to Phoenix to live in your basement. We do like Phoenix. I'm not that lucky. <laughs> I'm not that lucky. <laughs> We're not terrorizing Josh, at least not. <laughs> we moved to Dallas, and uh, the occasion is to watch the Mavs this season. We got season tickets to the Mavs. And here, I'll show you guys this. God, I gotta be so careful. I get so scared when I go out here. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, it's so fucking scary up here. Oh my God. <laughs> Let's go. So that's the American Airlines Center. Oh, I have to get away from the ledge. Oh, my God. You're not afraid of heights, are you there, Chris? Oh, oh. Oh, my God. I don't know if I'm able to do this show. Oh. Can you give us, a, give us a tour of the apartment? Like, the kitchen looks no. sick. Christina says, no, there's nothing in it. That's why there's this loud echo. There's just nothing mm -hmm. in it. And, and the hardwood floors, you fancy guys. You guys are so fancy with your hardwood floors. Thank you, sports cards. Thank Where's you, that? sports cards. We came up. We, we came up. <laughs> We are out of the basement. Yeah. Out of the basement and into debt. All right. 
You guys are living large in Texas, literally, across from the stadium. Fancy new kitchen. Man, you guys are just like living that sports card influencer life. I know. And and uh, you see all those people at the stadium. It was the Lumineers concert tonight. So I can't. We already missed that. I know. I know Is, that. I like them. Can you hear it? Is it going to be loud? No. No, we couldn't hear it. So, okay. You know what? You know what I thought of when I joined the live? This is funny, though. I have to, like, move this back now because the meme is making fun of people whose faces are <laughs> close to the camera. Yeah. Hey, we're doing the live, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Counting down. Okay. Uh, what, okay, all right. So one other thing before we get to questions. So many questions tonight. Uh, fantasy football, have you drafted? Are you Are you – have you participated in any drafts yet? No. Uh, I'm in two very serious leagues that have been going for a long time, and we always do them back-to-back -back nights uh, the week before the season starts because we like to minimize injury risk. Yep, that's the way to do it. I just Last year you uh, tipped me off to Jamar Chase, who I drafted in like the seventh or the eighth round. So I'm going to need another one of those tips this year because I won my league last year. Um, on the strength of Jamar Chase, I guard. And I lost my league on the strength. I, last year, my receivers were Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, and CeeDee Lamb, and I somehow did not. You can imagine, though, the rest of my team was terrible. Or injuries. Are you drafting Tyree Kill if he's on the board in the second round? Nope. Well, I, I have one league that's a three-person keeper, so I don't really have much choice over who I draft. And then the other league is auction, so I get all the choice of who I draft. I can choose anybody. <clears throat> okay. Oof. All right. If you have the number one overall pick, who are you taking? Mm. Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. Yeah, he's the consensus top pick. Cooper now, Cup's not a bad pick. Now the much, much harder question, if you have the number two pick, who are you taking? Well, admittedly, I haven't done my homework yet, so I couldn't even give you my okay. – I usually – I'm more of a cram – you know, I study last minute for fantasy kind of guy. Enough said. Enough said. All right. We'll, there's plenty of time to still talk about fantasy. There's still a few weeks until the season starts. All right. Uh, first question from cards underscore cards 08. Promote it on card stuff IG. I'm so glad you did this. <laughs> Read what I wrote. <laughs> what did you, okay, hold on. He replied to you, too. He or she. I know. I was like, holy shit, he wants me to DM him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where is it? Hang on. <laughs> I can't. Oh, here it is. Okay. <clears throat> Cardboard Chronicles replies, I'm on it. What am I promoting, though? I need more guidance. <laughs> <laughs> and Cards so Cards 08 says, please DM me, sir, with two... Heart emoji eyes. Ooh. And then that si that stunned you. <laughs> that silence, dude. I just was like complete stunned silence. I couldn't even respond. No idea what to do with that. I did not DM that person. All right. Well, great question to kick the show off. Thank you, Cards Cards 08, making a strong <laughs> push to be one of our top question askers. I think that account will be gone next week, so that hopefully they watch it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Jam Collectibles says, please discuss high-end cards that are listed too frequently, This their, uh, thereby plummeting their value. All right. So, like, one example of this that I was thinking of was the championship ticket Brady. So let me, mm. just, let me just paint a very quick picture for you. Um, this beautiful card, the championship ticket Brady, BGS 8.5, it sold for $1.2 yesterday, which is a, a phenomenal price. Uh, but what's interesting about the sales history of this card is that from 2004 to 2020, it sold nine times. And then in the last two years, it sold nine times. Wow. So an asymmetrical distribution of sales. So basically, these nine sales are from uh, a 16-year window. These nine sales are from a two-year window. 
I think that goes to the question askers points. What do you think? Uh, I mean, yeah, we talked about this last week a bit. Um, one thing I have noticed, I posted a bunch of stories about this, and this was kind of a theme again. Um, it seems that it's like rookie cards that are numbered to like the 100 range. You know, like it's like they're rare rookie cards, but not really scarce, especially in this climate where people are a little bit nervous. So they're just kind of selling over and over and chasing it down. But yeah, like there's a lot of factors, you know, one being that the auction houses are kind of putting pressure on people to sell that kind of stuff right now. And, you know, people are getting frustrated that they bought it and they're seeing it go down. So they're kind of trying to cut their losses maybe and just and just move into something else. Um, and I'll, and I'll, those cards are kind of seen as like, they're kind of seen as like investment cards of those guys that are meant to be safe. And they were, they were meant to be this like safe haven for people that left the base card thing. And it's like very disappointing for those folks that it's not, and they never really wanted to collect them. So now they're just kind of dumping them. That's the unfortunate truth for a lot of it. Um, and we're just seeing the supply go up. What do you think? Yes. And I agree. 99 to 100 copies is potentially quite a few, especially yep. If, uh, especially if uh, they're going to be, you know, flipped around and transacted, you know, as if they're, um, I mean, what what's the comparison, you know? Uh, my understanding is that homes and real estate, you know, maybe turn over once every seven years um, on average. You know, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're, I just don't know if there's a comparison for like, so, okay. So for this Brady, for example, all right, this Brady, uh, if you look at the sales history, the sale, uh, of the, the $1.2 million card that sold last night, it, it sold for 2 million four months ago. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> same <laughs> so, one, same exact slab, same, same, same really up. Yeah, so somebody, you know, had the privilege of owning this card for only four months, uh, and the value dropped 800000 plus the seller had to pay, you know, uh, I think the PWCC's fee is 5% on items over a million bucks, so they had to pay sixty grand more in fees, if I did math right, so the seller ends up, you know, 860 grand lost so <clears throat> that's <laughs> you know but hey if this and then uh julian in the chat makes a really good point he says there's there's another copy of this card on heritage right now there's Ugh. there's another one going live on heritage next month so basically Ugh. there was three active copies last night and julian says if i was the bidder that impacts the further the fervor with which I bid. Yeah, bingo. I don't even think this is super complicated or tricky. I think this is this is pretty obvious. Part that makes it tricky, though, for me, at least, like in responding to people's DMs and reactions to it, is that like people are feeling like, um, you know, if this is able to happen to Brady, someone like Brady, who's about as safe as it gets in terms of you know, legacy and career and play as a player, if it's going to happen to him, isn't everyone else kind of screwed? Like, why is this happening to someone of the stature of Tom Brady? And the response that I've given is like, this has nothing to do with Brady, the player and his accomplishments. It's really just a matter of like economics. If something goes up 10 X in a year, and then all of a sudden you have 10 copies sell in the next few months, like there's no possible way it's not going to go down. It's just impossible. So, you know, the real thing is like, if you're going to be spending that kind of money on something or any amount of dollar amount of a card, like make sure you either like understand the market dynamics and the economics of it, or you just genuinely want to own that card at that price you're paying, which is to me always like step number one, but I understand that's not for everybody. So I don't know. <clears throat> right on. Nailed it. All right. We have a lot more questions in this vein. So the next one is from Kendall does cards. He says, has there ever been a market, that survives long term when there's such a large spread between what the buyer of the card pays and what the seller of the card takes home and so this is a question basically about marketplace fees 
And I thought there was a really nice illustration of this from last night's auction. All right, so there is an amazing card. Here, let me give you a visual aid of it. There's an amazing card that sold last night. Um, it was the uh, 2000 Brady Bowman Gold, which I believe uh, is one of the very few numbered Brady rookies. And so I just want to pull the picture of the card so you can see it. This is the jersey numbered copy of the 2000 Bowman Gold. It's numbered 12 of 99. That card sold last night for uh, 100 and, uh, 192 grand. And it had sold nine months earlier for 288. Okay, so last, last fall it sold for 288 sold for 192 last night. The card lost, this exact card lost $96,000 in value, 96 grand over the last nine months. Uh, now the two auction houses that did the two sales, the first, it, it doesn't matter who they were, it's two different auction houses, two different marketplaces. If we assume that there's a 20% buyer's premium on this item, then those two auction houses actually netted 96,000 in profits because of the 20% BP applied to 288K and 20% BP applied to 192K. Comes out to 96K in profit. So I really enjoyed the symmetry there of over the last nine months, this card loses $96,000 in value, but the marketplaces that sold it made exactly $96,000 in profit. It's almost as if there was a transfer of wealth from the person who owned the card for a nine month period to then the marketplaces that sold it. A perfect one, but it actually, the person who sold the card got hammered worse because even though the card lost $96,000 in value, they still had to give up 20% of the sale as a buyer's premium. So really right. they lost around $140,000 in total. So, all right, going back to Kendall's question, can a market last long-term when there is such a giant spread between what the buyer pays for the card, and then what the owner of the card, the seller of the card, ultimately takes home. So the question is like, are the fees too high? <laughs> I think so, yeah, I think that's basically it. Well, I mean, these fees are the same in the art industry, I believe. I believe the buyer's premium and like the high-end art is similar, and we've had it like this in cards for quite a bit, for quite a long time. I don't remember it never being not 20%, <laughs> the buyer's premium side of it, at least on the, you know, the auction houses. Yeah. Uh, I personally think it's like really, really high and too high. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not on the business side or financial side of these auction houses. The real question to me, like the meat of this comes down to like, what can the auction houses do to like tip the scales back into the collector's favor to where it's still profitable for them long term? which is what you said in your story a couple of times. I think like there's a balance between trying to profit on this stuff short term, which every company is trying to do and should be doing. But how can you actually find that perfect balance to where not only does it benefit you short term, maybe less short term, but like more long term, especially on the side of like keeping the buyers and sellers active. And the only way to do that is to keep the hobby growing and keep collectors and investors equally happy. So I'm not sure, you know, I don't know like the perfect answer, but to me, it seems like, um, there should be more focus on helping the collector be engaged in the hobby and less of the pressure to make people sell in a down market. That to me seems like the first step. What do you think about, about that? Yeah, I think it's a very dangerous and slippery slope that we can land on when we've got a market that's in a lot of <clears throat> categories trending down, certainly not in all, but in a lot of categories, the market is trending down. And there's been such a run up in price over the last few years that there's a very easy, you know, trap that that is made by this, which is, hey, you better sell your cards now or uh, before the market comes down even further. And if that, in fact, becomes a seductive trap that lures owners of cards into it, then what's going to happen is you're gonna have a, uh, an increasing amount of cards being brought to sell. And that is only gonna exacerbate and accelerate the problem that already exists 
because there already are too many copies available uh, of cards that, you know, I, I think it's just, you really have to put this into, into context here. The Brady Champ ticket BGS 85 sold nine times between 2004 and 2020, and then it sold nine times in between 2020 and today. Nine times over 16 years, that means one came out about every two years, and then nine times over two years, which means one's coming out every, every few months, every three or four months. Uh, that's just a, a shocking difference. And it's also the, the part that's really difficult to navigate here is that the incentives don't really line up because the incentive of the marketplaces and the auction house is to get as many cards for sale as possible and then to get buyers to bid as strongly as possible on them. Well, those incentives don't really line up with a market doing well long term. You know, if you convince all 28 owners of the 28 BGS 85 copies that they need to sell, that's going to drive the price of that card down substantially. So that's the conundrum, the problem that we're in right now is that there's marketplaces are strongly incentivized to convince collectors to sell their cards. But if collectors keep selling their cards at an abnormal rate that doesn't match the historical sales pattern for that card, they're at risk of completely tanking the market for those particular cards. Yeah, great points in the chat. Uh, Eric brought up the point that um, the fees decrease as the value of the car or this value of the sale goes up. So over 500k is 7.5 over a million but i'm going to rebuttal and say those are for sellers so again we're talking about like incentivizing the fee structure towards the sellers and the buyer is the one that has to take all the hit and the buyer is what in my opinion the buyer is the lifeblood of the hobby that's the person that's the collector the investor the person buying and continuing to go and if i feel like i'm having to pay 20 percent to buy something um you know it's it's a it's a big hit on purchasing cards and like continuing to to fill the hobby and then there was another chat i wanted to hit oh carbon says you know you can't really control the people selling cards and there's a there's a decent argument that says like even if the auction house is backed off and just let it come to them like that people would be flooding the market because of prices going down and they make these decisions on their own it's a valid point and you know we kind of have to like let the market uh figure out its own bottom and it'll it'll get to that point on its own and we don't we don't need anyone to try to like force it i think we're more talking about like the intent of some of these businesses that the intent should be more oriented towards collectors and and people continuing to stay in the hobby it's not that we are saying they're not doing that intentionally it's that it's just like another reminder like this is kind of what keeps things going in our opinion and i'd like to see more businesses kind of focus on it and and maybe it doesn't have to be like, hey, let's change everything overnight. Like, let's change our fee structure because this guy says so. Let's introduce like things here and there that, you know, are very obvious signs that we're trying to make things better for collectors and we're trying to, you know, incentivize the future of the hobby. Yeah. Yep. Right on. Well, that Carvin's comments and your reply to it dovetail pretty nicely with this next question from Cards and Candy 911, the legend himself. Uh, Cards and Candy, great to see you back. He writes, the people selling all their grails on PWCC and or Golden. And, I, and just before I finish this question, can we just take notice of something? Listen to the tenor of these questions. People are concerned about this. There is a strong perception that's been building over the last half a year to a year that the market is being flooded with too many copies of cards that normally don't sell that much. And I think that that is something in the, just taking a step back and just notice this. People are concerned, people are discontented, people are, people are using platforms like ours and others to speak out about it. All right, anyway, back to the question. The people selling all their grails on PWCC and or Golden are people that bought them years ago, correct? So if that's the case, and all the people cashing out now, well then will it take another five to 10 years for us to see those cards pop back up for sale again? 
because I'm sure that these big time half a million dollar purchases are not just to quick flip. So let me just give a quick reply to this because Cars and Candy, I agree with the sentiment of your post, but some of them are quick flips, man. As weird as that seems, some of them are quick flips and we just showed one of them. So this Brady 8.5 Contenders Champ ticket, this copy that sold for 2 million here is the exact same copy that sold four mo months later for 1.2. I'm not sure if the intention was to flip or why it got sold so quickly, but literally that's two of the nine sales of this card in the last two years are of the same exact copy. Somebody bought it and sold it super duper quick. Okay, go, go ahead, Joshua, what do you think? Are, are, are we gonna see way less, co way less copies pop up after you know, these, these change over and these turn hands and people have been holding them for five or 10 years, move out of them. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's, it's definitely not like 100% just the, uh, you know, people cashing in after five to 10 years of holding. I, I know that's not true because we have examples of it. And it is a lot of people that came into the hobby, bought at peak, got excited, joined the, joined the hype, joined the FOMO, and then, you know, maybe thought like, hey, this isn't exactly for me. You know, I'll just cut my losses and get out now. There's definitely some of that going on. When will we see it? I mean, it's it has more to do with like what Carbon was saying. Like, we just got to find the bottom, right? It's just gonna it's just a matter of um, when enough copies come out, the price is gonna eventually keep going down, and eventually, like, it's gonna find its bottom. And then either there's gonna be a combination of all the people that own that card now are into it for these new prices, and they're just gonna hold and wait for it to either go up or or now they're a collector. Or, um, or like the people who had it at the higher prices are just like gonna wait it out. Like they're just gonna wait for it to come back. So it's just a matter of like people waiting at these new prices and just holding and no longer selling. They feel like the bottom has been found. And I don't know enough about like market economics and dynamics and supply and demand to give you like an exact more scientific answer than that. I think that's a pretty good answer. Uh... All right, let's go to the next question here. We've still got several more on this topic or related. Dude, to even it. people in the chat are getting frustrated, Chris. Like, I know. You can, you can just kind of sense the tension of like, we're, they're sick of people like us saying the same answer of like, oh, it'll turn around eventually. We're not even saying that. We, we're the ones that are being realistic about it and seeing the supply continue to increase. And we're seeing signs that that, that supply is going to keep increasing because of the pressure from the auction houses. Exactly. And, and that's... Hey, whether it's in the chat, I see it all over social media. You know, Pete, I, it's in DMs and messages that I'm, I'm sharing with people. Like, people are very concerned. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's worth taking notice of because the concern precipitates action. People's philosophical, you know, approaches are being molded and shaped. They're forming new opinions they're forming new perspectives on this industry on collecting cards on the hobby and then once those new opinions are formed and solidified they act on them and they act in accordance with them this is you know a time here to uh to really think about that and think about what impression are we creating on collectors you know it, this is a topic that branches off into social media in general right now which i think is rapidly becoming a, a wasteland and we've been talking about this josh privately is social media right now is it's becoming corporatized it's becoming sellout nonsense bullshit the all of the fun things of the hobby that we like to do those things are being converted into you know ways to sell people on a service or a product and that's not how hobby social media became you know, the boon that it is and the very popular setting that it is, it was organic, but now this, these things are being captured and converted and, you know, people are building up social media accounts for the purposes of, you know, hopefully getting a, you know, a sponsorship or, you know, something like that. And that's completely fine. I support people who do that. I support people who are sponsored and who make sponsored content and who are working hard in this hobby, but it's ending up to where as hobby social media is being, it's becoming focused on, people and you know feuds and opinions and influencers and it's com we've completely lost our way we've completely and totally lost the magic 
and the things that made hobby social media special, the things that made me, that made you, that made us enjoy coming on Instagram. I don't even scroll my fucking feed anymore. I don't even scroll my feed to look for cards because all it's gonna be is a bunch of ads and pump posts and nothing authentic, nothing genuine. It's, you know, I'm lucky if I find collectors that I like posting cards. It's just buried in a, in a pile of garbage. I almost want to issue the social media hobby challenge. One. Yeah, not yet. We'll save that for the end of the show. <laughs> I, I love that you're fired up. I'm fired up with you. I'm fired up. I, we, need to talk through the, we need to talk through the actual mechanics of that before I uh, start. Because <laughs> it's, it's a little more complicated than that. All right. <laughs> um, but I did want to, I want to build off your, your rant because I thought it was really strong and, and great point. Um, there's too much hobby content centered around the, this is weird to say, it's too much centered around the person and not like the cards and the content. I think you've kind of eloquent, made a, a better eloquent point about that in the past where is the content, is the feed, is the account centered around the person, the influencer, or is it centered around the cards? and the content with which they're talking about, which is like, you know, the history of cards, or maybe you've got some sort of interesting take on the art of cards, or like there's all these different ways to create content about cards that isn't about you. Um, and we're just seeing a lot more of that, and that's the frustrating part. I think maybe that's kind of like the, one of the easier things to look for in what you're talking about. Dude, and also the ads, Instagram definitely changed the ad algorithm on their app. You get way more ads than before. It's fucking super noticeable, and it's, horribly annoying yeah yeah it is here look <clears throat> i'm gonna give these fucking hobby companies i'm very upset i'm gonna give these hobby companies a free uh tool it's nothing that i came up with i just observed it jim beckett and beckett magazine uh shepherded this hobby through a very important and transformative period in the 90s. Back at magazines and all the major sports had a circulation of a million copies per month. That magazine is the reason why, is, is still the reason why this hobby is so big today, is because it created a lot of nostalgia for us kids who collected back in the 90s and now we're adults. Beckett Magazine made it a purpose to do specials and features on super collectors. They would dedicate pages and pages of valuable real estate in their magazines, basketball, I remember in specific, they would dedicate pages of valuable real estate in that magazine to showcasing a super collector of a given player. And why would Beckett do that? It's not, you know, it's, 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 it has nothing to do with the price guide. You know, it's, it, it's, it was, by showcasing the super collectors, they were putting the spotlight back on the real stars of the show, which is the cards, which is the items that we're collecting. And in the story and the, and the enjoyment that collecting gives these super collectors. When I go to social media pages of, of, uh, of content, very rarely are we putting the spotlight on super collectors or special cards just for the sake of doing it. Um, instead, you know, it's, it's always lined up with some ultimate goal of, of one thing or another. So I guess what I'm getting at here is let's rebuild the culture on social media. Let's rebuild this, the collector culture. Let's, let's make going on social media fun again because I'm, I'm in complete honesty it really hasn't been fun for me much the last few months it's just it's devolved and it's and it's getting even worse well your stories are sorely missed dude you posted like five stories in a row today and it was like oh my god i missed <laughs> the organizational you know strength that you have the the pointed topics you have the like strong contrast of your green backgrounds with your white font it's very easy to consume and very enjoyable so it's just if like you guys fuck this up and we lose chris's content this is on you guys come on fix this shit <laughs> yeah i'll be back to talking trash I, that that was just because i was moving this week but 
and I, and then I was sick before that. I, I'll, I'm, I'm just, I'm nothing more than just a, a social media addict anyway. So. <laughs> is, it, is your, is your freebie advice kind of like put the focus back on the sort of like underground nature of the super collector and the person who sort of silently moves through the hobby and less on the celebrities and the hype and the money. Is that kind of nailed it? If you're lucky enough to have built up a platform on social media, use it to make the community a better place at least as often as you use it to make yourself richer. Mm, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> uh, you know, take a penny, leave a penny kind of thing. There you go. Take a penny, leave a penny. That's good. Yeah. It should be like that in general. Like that's sounds like a human decency thing. It's like if someone you're having a conversation with someone, and you know they're asking you questions and you're talking about yourself you're telling them about your day you should respond with like okay what now tell me about yourself let's point the camera at someone else let's focus on some other piece of you know content whether it be some other card you found or some instagram account so that's a you know that's an easy little way to do it and what's the content that gets you the most excited to be in the hobby that gets you looking and researching for new cards super easy it's usually a, it, one, the easiest one, which is unsustainable, is a new account that has cards that I didn't know that this person existed, and they came onto Instagram and they started posting all their stuff one day. Like when Bob M track came in, that guy gave me like two months of enjoyment because it was just like, oh my god, I can see where this is going, what's next, kind of thing, and it was just like this slow build of all these different cards. And by the way, we don't even know what that guy looks like. He's like the opposite of what we're describing. He literally, we don't even know what he looks like. We know nothing about this guy. All we know is that his cards are amazing. And he's got one of the most popular, most amazing accounts on Instagram. So that's an easy one. Um, I guess next would be something like interesting factoids or, you know, hobby educational pieces on like why you collect the specific thing you do. Like what makes it like MK Sports Cards, Mike does a great job of this. He has all these reasons for all these crazy sets. <laughs> he collects so many random things. I can't keep up with all of it, but he's always got a reason for why. And he has like very specific reasons about why he collects specific players in that insert set and not others and why he builds trios of the Bulls. And then he collects, you know, other players for specific reasons. So stuff like that always interests me. Those are like the two. And both of those are just, you know, literally you could just post pictures of cards and you basically cover both of those scenarios. Yeah. Uh, I posted to my story a few days ago, uh, a bit ironically, the Ted Yates video from 10 years ago, where he's at, uh, he just got all of his Jordan Flair legacy collections graded and he just has them in, on piles in front of him. And that's the content that gets me so fired up. <laughs> it's like I know you like the box thing too. Yeah, the the one row where you just like reveal one at a time. Love it, love it. it, it and yeah, that that sucks me in every time when somebody's just showing cards. You know, it's just <laughs> like yeah, I I've it captures something in my uh, my lizard brain. <laughs> Not too. Uh... Not to build up Nat anymore because he doesn't need it, but I always like when he does his like player posts and he'll do like ten pictures in one post and you swipe through like his favorite ten cards of that player mm -hmm. stuff like that's cool too. Yeah, because you can always reinvent your own cards that we've already seen in different formats. Totally, totally. Look, I used to be a big baby about people reposting cards. Please repost your cards. Uh, now you're like bring bring it back. Bring it back. I'm I was wrong. We need to see, please, can, I, I would do anything to take the reposts. Okay, here's that post that Matt did. And this post had me cracking up because I already knew what card was coming last. All right, you already know what card is coming last. He's doing the 98 Ultra Masterpieces. Oops. He's got the Patrick Ewing. He's got the Shreve Abdur Rahim, the Grant Hill. He's got the Tim Hardaway. Shout out to Pops of Tim Hardaway Jr. I'm going to be seeing your son play a lot of games this year. Avery Johnson. Do you know what card is coming last, Josh? The MJ. Look at this fucking guy. Tyrone. Look, he, he thought that through. He thought, if I put that last, you got to scroll through every single one. <laughs> yes, he did. I'm guaranteed. And there it is. The MJ Purple Masterpiece 1 of 1 from 1998. <laughs> 
Nathaniel Turner, authentic. Come on, bro. Let's see that PSA three. I don't care if it's got a fucking dent in it or a scratch or whatever. Show us that PSA two and a half. It's like missing a full corner. I want to see the grade. It looks fine. I don't know why it wouldn't grade like a six or, or at least. It looks great. I mean, even if it was a four, who cares? It's a freaking one of one. Show us the number. Dude, we should start making a hashtag. No, hashtag no more authentic or hashtag show us the number. <laughs> All right, let's, let's go. We got some more questions. We're getting, let's not get too sappy here. Let's keep our head. Let's turn the mood, turn the mood a little bit. Yeah, come on. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sasha P. Card says, live streaming of auctions. Is this the future of hobby content? What is more invigorating than watching bidding wars, experts share knowledge, and seeing millions of dollars spent on cards? I enjoy it more than breaking. I mean, Jake Roy started that a while back, a long time ago. We, we did that a few years ago with Jake. Uh, it's great content. It's fun for the people hosting it. It's fun for the audience. It's great for YouTube. Uh, it's great for, like, the YouTube platform. I mean, yeah. I agree. Are we ever going to do one of those? Uh, There's a big gold option tomorrow night. Well, no, it's not a big one, but it, they, they have much bigger ones. But uh... All right. In Cardboard Veritas says, Probstein has a new fee, 5%. Will this help solve the huge hobby problem of excess selling fees? Dang, 5% is pretty dang. That's got to be the lowest in the industry right now, right? I think so. Well, uh, 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 that's not lower than my slabs, for example, but True. perhaps the lowest. For, the auction. for an auction. For an auction that's on a let, let's qualify it this way. For an auction, one, and then two that's on a platform with a bunch of eyeballs, which is eBay. Yeah, I mean, Probstein clearly does a ton of volume on eBay, and eBay has rewarded them with lower fees to make this feasible for them. So, this is kind of one of those examples where it's like. Will this make Probstein less money in the short term? I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but it seems like it would. But it's going to benefit them long term because more people are going to want to save money. And it's, a, you know, it's a, a win for collectors to save money. So if nothing else, um, you know, if you don't like Probstein for whatever reason, you prefer you know, the Goldens of the world, um, this is you know, competition. And competition is going to breed you know, other companies having to match it. And maybe this will be, ended up being better for the customer in the long run, this first little domino maybe. Right on. All right. Uh, and Mike Pinkerton 50 asks a big question. Uh, do you think that institutional money will keep pouring into the hobby if the prices on cards keep going down? Pouring? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed, like, wouldn't it seem like institutional money would come in more at this point than it would when things are all rosy and going up infinitely? Dude, Josh, here's my question, man. What is the institution? If you're good at... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, no, I just... Like, if you're good at day trading, don't you buy low and sell high? <laughs> Absolutely. But but that's that's my question. What is the institutional money being spent on? Is the, If the institutional money is being spent to build in, and uh, staff out businesses then yeah, mm -hmm. I think there's a real risk that it stops because we don't really need any more businesses. We've got too many businesses. Uh, we've, got, we've got too many. Uh, what, um, and it, we have businesses that are being created to try and capture market share, uh, but not, they're not stepping up to fill any felt need. Right, um, big difference, big difference. Yes, if, now if businesses were coming in and creating innovative solutions to problems that need solving. That's a totally, then in, in those situations, you know, th those are always situations that are ripe for institutional grade infrastructure related investment. But here, but if the, if to Josh's point, if institutional money is being invested into the asset, into the card itself, then yes, there now, now is a much better time to be buying cards than six months ago for in, in the case of like Brady cards, for example. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know. We might consider ourselves Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, but those guys would probably tell you if it's cheaper, that's better to buy than when it's more expensive. It's because it's you're going to make more money. Especially if you believe in its long-term proposition. So since we're giving out free tips, that's a free tip for everybody. Yeah. And I, what what would uh, what would our men our mentors Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger say? Say, look at the fundamentals. Look at the fundamentals. <laughs> Look at, you know, the, the history. And those guys probably would not like sports cards if we're just being completely honest here. But maybe they would be more of the Keynesian uh, point of view. Because Keynes was a, was a, even though he was one of the brilliant economists of the first half of the 20th century and completely shaped a school of thought, um, his preferred asset of choice was art. He felt that art made for a great investment for many of the same reasons that a lot of us believe cards will be, you know, will will do quite well over the long haul. So maybe they would like collectibles and things of that nature. Maybe they wouldn't. But uh, anyway, all right. Yeah, I want to kind of do one more yeah. little mini supplement. I Talking about the too many businesses, like as an individual who's been in the hobby for a long time and who knows, you know, I know how I function in the hobby. I know what, what tools I need and such. Yep. I don't need that much. You know, like I, I need a place to grade my cards accurately, decent price. Like I need a, I need a, so I have that. I've got PSA, they grade my cards. Yep. I need a place to buy and sell cards. You know, we've got plenty of marketplaces and then I need, and then we needed a place to like track our collection. So we just like built that ourselves and price stuff. And I need supplies. Am I like what? <laughs> so there's just been this like popping up of companies that the goal is to make that company successful and make it money for that company and build a company versus like, what is this tool doing for the collector? What is this business? How does this business propel the, the industry forward? Because if it doesn't, then eventually like people are just going to stop paying for that thing. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Drake's PC says to follow up on some of the story posts that I made earlier today. Uh, what should hobby businesses do to prioritize the collector's well-being? So that's that's a great question and a great follow-up. And you know what? You know, one of the things here, we're not in the uh, we're not in the world of giving free advice to companies that are making money hand over fist already. So that's number one, um, but it's especially not publicly. But, uh, but here's number two, here's a couple of ways that I think in general, you can prioritize the collector's well-being. And the first and the most important one is counseling them with appropriate advice that is in their best interest, not in the best interest necessarily of the business in the short term. So, you know, there, there's always an incentive to create the impression that, you know, leads to your business making the most money in the short term. But sometimes the advice that a company can counsel its, its, its potential clients and collectors with will serve that interest, but it won't serve that collector's long-term interest. It might even push them out of the hobby. It's okay to remark, hey, maybe a card is, you know, really overheated right now. You know, I don't know, man. I don't want to get into the weeds on this question. I think it's a very sophisticated, difficult question. But I, but I think the answers become obvious when there's a philosophical shift. And operators in this space operate from the point of view that let's do everything we can to make our collectors as happy as we can. I got, I got an exa I got a specific yeah, example. For go you. for it. There are many auction houses. There's, auction houses are hiring like crazy. They're finding these people to help source stuff and bring stuff to auction. Help collectors find cards they want to buy, and you will still make the transaction happen. Versus trying to get people to sell their cards in an open auction that someone will win. You can connect these to cards. People want these cards. People are winning these cards at auctions. 
find the people who are trying to buy this stuff, myself included. I posted very publicly I was looking for a card to all of these places. It's gone to auction four times now. How has it not come to me once? I don't understand that. How has it not privately been offered to me? That's an example. Like, help the collector find the card they're looking for instead of, like, making us all fight over it in auction in certain cases when you can help the collector build the industry going forward. But that's one freebie. Nice. All right. <clears throat> Uh, th that, that, the answer to that question is also a work in progress that evolves over time. I think kind of what's happening right now is a recognition that there is a lot of discontent. Look across social media today. Look across, you know, your DMs and conversations with collectors. Talk mm. to people. Ask them what is their sense of their enjoyment of the hobby right now recognizing that there's friction points that there's discontent that there's tension that there's issues that's the stage that we're at right now we need to get on the same page with that people are getting frustrated people are getting pissed in quantities that i did not see six months ago a year ago two years ago the problem is coming to a head let's just acknowledge it let's look at it and notice that it's happening and then once we're able to get on the same page with the problem we can start thinking things through as a collective, as individual businesses. And I don't exempt us at Card Ladder from thinking through ways that we can better serve the collector and so on and so forth. But I think it's pretty obvious where we think about that all the time. I need to bring back the to the moon button. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep, that will solve a lot of problems. All right. Uh, six cards would like to know, what is your current market outlook? <laughs> Dude, come on. It's like hour one. Is it still hour one? What the fuck are you doing with that question? <laughs> come on. Give it a give it a shot. After we just uh after we just uh <laughs> sung, you know, the 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 song of disaster. What so, is your market outlook? My friends and I that this comp this uh company that I used to work for, you know, we're a bunch of engineers. We're a fairly cynical bunch of people. Like engineers are just very cynical, that's just the way it is. And we used to go to lunch and we would just like talk shit about everything. Like, oh, this, you know, the company's making mistakes here. Like the, the industry's going to shit, blah, blah, blah. But we would always come back from lunch and it was the same joke every time. We'd be walking into the building to come back. We'd always go, well, other than that, things are pretty good, guys. <laughs> like, I don't know. That was a lot of shit. But other than that, I kind of feel like that's the answer here. Like, other than all that stuff we just said, the market's looking good. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, things are getting... uh weirdly complicated with the interaction between like social media and real life stuff that's happening. Um, there's a new podcast. Just bear with me for two seconds here. That uh, it, 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 I think the guy's name is Derek Thompson. And his podcast is on the ringer, obviously. Oh, yeah, here it is. It's called Plain English with Derek Thompson on Apple. And, I, and, and he just like, his, his whole thing is he takes things that are in the news, things that are happening, and he, uh, and he you know, tries to do the research for you, for those of us who don't have time to look it all up for ourselves. Okay, so here's his most recent episode. His most recent episode is, why does it seem like everybody hates everything? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And Chuck Klosterman joins to discuss fandom culture, which we have in abundance in the hobby, and how it has affected politics. Okay, that's fine. So best-selling author Klosterman talks to Derek about the death of monoculture, how the internet creates cults of fans and anti-fans, and how hating things became a mainstream personality trait and a political position. All right? So... I haven't listened to this podcast episode yet, but, you know, we, we have to, it's, and it's good that people are like stepping back and thinking about these things. We have to understand what it is that we're actually saying and what we're not saying and not read right. into it too far and understand that this is like how people are communicating right now. And this, especially like as the hobby uh, content and interaction becomes more and more just like social media 
And, you know, we were kind of talking about this. You know, there's a great question on this. Let me, let me just go to this question. Um, <coughs> here, this question is from Chromie G. He goes, secretly, I love hobby drama. <laughs> I saw that. It's a nice little five to 10 minute escape throughout the day. However, at what cost to the person behind the scandal? Do you think the hobbyists' livelihoods are actually impacted when their indiscretions are plastered all over social media? Or do we have so much weekly drama that we just get it and forget about it? Well, first off, it's no longer a secret that he likes the hobby drama. Thank you for that. But look, this is part of the complexity of understanding what it is and what we are and what we're doing. And people like hobby drama, but they then, at least some of them come to the realization that there's a human being who's on the other end of the ridicule, even if the person made a mistake and that's what caused them to get ridiculed. You know, who doesn't make mistakes? I'd love to see the person in the hobby who doesn't make mistakes. So, but, but for some people making a mistake results in them getting just absolutely decimated uh, by people online. So, all right, here, we're, tying, we're tying all this together to say something about the state of the hobby, about how the way we're relating to each other is by hating on things, like that is becoming part of mainstream culture. What do you think about all this? Cancel culture has found its way into cards where we're like waiting for someone to screw up so we can jump all over them and make content around it and watch them burn to the ground. Which proves um, that there's something natural about that impulse. Like that impulse is an outlet. The fact that like, you know, oh, we're gonna just, you know, tear down somebody. That impulse, it exists now in the hobby as we've become this social media centric community, but it's been in social media centric communities for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I usually approach this topic from the point of view of balance. Like when the market was just going bananas a year ago, I feel like me and you were kind of one of the few people like, hold on a second, this stuff doesn't make any sense. These cards are high population, everyone pump the brakes. And then when stuff started going down in the last few months, we've been here talking about, you know, the positivity of what cards you should be looking for in terms of your collection and how to like pivot into more fun things. So we've always tried to take this approach of like kind of doing the opposite of the current feeling of the market. This one though is different because now we're talking about sort of like the fun part of it, the enjoyment in terms of the social media and the, the uh, community aspect of it. And when that gets screwed up, then we have a real problem because now our fun is being screwed with. And we're not just talking about prices, right? We're not just talking about the market moving. Now we're talking about you're actively in my feed, making it less fun for me. We got to figure something out. So I think that's kind of where I'm at in terms of this new, uh, you know, shift that we're going through in terms of that. How do we make it more fun? You know, in turn, like the stuff, the stories I was posting today, um, you know, some of the sentiment I got was like around the opinion that I was forming on it. Like I was trying to push some opinion. I'm just posting screenshots of like all the top 20 that I saw. It was just like, here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing some stuff flatten out. I'm seeing some stuff keep going down. I'm seeing some markets continue to go up. These are just sort of the facts of it. And in terms of the social media and, you know, the, the, the sentiment that we're gathering from people and on DMs and such is that like they're pissed off at the supply being too high, you know, too many cards selling. So this is kind of just us reporting some of that stuff. And then we like to look for solutions. So like, how can we, what can we do as individuals and how can we make some changes? Cause if not, then you're right. We are just like bitching and hating on everything. We can't, we can't only bitch and hate. We got to figure out what can we do in our small little corner to make tiny, you know, incremental improvements? Well, you know what my social media hobby challenge is. <laughs> Yeah, I just was like thinking about it more. I'm with you. It's just like I have to figure out how to turn off notifications on my DMs because I, if I get the, I can't not read them. Look, we don't have to do it, all right? We can try it for six hours. All right, first of all, here's what my challenge is, all right? My challenge is because, Josh, this is what made me think about it. You were like, what, what can we do to make – being on being in the hobby more fun because right now being on social media is becoming very negative 
and it's getting nasty. So what can we do to make it more fun? Well, here's my social media challenge. Get the hell off of social media. Take a day off, take a week off and say, I'm going to find ways and reinvent ways to enjoy my collection and enjoy my interaction with the hobby without participating in the hobby social media culture. And, and see, you know, maybe, maybe what we find is that there isn't a better way that, Hey, mm -hmm. this is just as good as it's going to get. There was a golden age of hobby enjoyment. It's over now. Or maybe you're going to find that social media really isn't as bad that we just got callous to it and that we miss it. And then, Hey, let's go back and we'll have a new newfound appreciation for it. Or, Maybe what you find is that there's lots of ways to enjoy this hobby that used to be on social media that no longer are on social media. So now I have to find new places to reinvent them and to, and to relocate them. So that's what I would say. That's what I'm going to try doing um, sometime in the next seven days. <laughs> it's just, I'm just going to not go on Instagram for like two days and see what happens. The problem is I have so many group chats of people that I want to talk to, but. It's the DM thought, the DM part of it. I couldn't quite like wrap my brain around how to figure that out. You know, Cause like, obviously like one of them is that we run a business and people ask questions on like <laughs> how to solve the tech problem. I'm like, uh, sorry, I didn't see your DM for a week. <laughs> yeah. That's a small, that's definitely a small problem, but. Uh, um, no, I'm with you, man. Like you say this more than anyone I've heard on Instagram and in the, it's supposed to be a fun fucking hobby. Like, what are we, like, we've keep talking about all this crazy shit. And it's like, the further we get, the, the more we talk about this stuff, the further we are away from like, isn't this supposed to just be like, like a silly hobby? Like it's an escape. It's, we're looking at pictures of, you know, men on cardboard. It's kind of silly on a surface and we're spending money on it. because We enjoy it. And we like building these collections. That was the other thing I thought of today when we, th when we started talking about this, like, how has the focus gone away from like literally the word collecting the word collecting means to gather and like obtain more of these items. And instead the focus is like, let's sell everything and figure out what the price is when we sell, sell, sell. That's not even, that's like the opposite of collecting. You're just like, you just, you're just a marketplace. Now you're just like a, you know, an eBay store or a Shopify drop shipper guy. Like this isn't even a collecting hobby anymore. It's just like selling and making money. So, whatever we individually have to do to focus on the hobby and the fun collecting side of it, you know, that's what you got to do. Maybe we got to go back to blowout. <laughs> maybe, maybe we really, really come full circle. You know what else is going to help too? Sports coming back is going to uh, fucking help. Maybe that's the problem. We're just like yes. fighting with each other on summer break. Cause we just are stuck in the, stuck in the yeah. inside. We don't have any basketball or football to watch. I think that is definitely, you know, because we were talking about like a, like some content that I really like that gets me excited these days is when people really dig into sports history and tie sports history with sports card history and you, and tell stories about cards. I think that the, this episode where he, I texted you, he's blending these like player videos and then he made some like really great like home run connection to it. He goes, and the cards connect us to all the stuff we love about the history of these players. And it's like, Oh my God, that's why I started collecting in the first place. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I loved when uh, Joe Montana just like took the card and just like, <laughs> now, now I know why they're all PSA sixes. <laughs> Yo, that was such like a 60 year old swag. Just, you know, with that little smirk on his face, just, <laughs> And everyone's like, no, you're damaging the corners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, so this question came in from Brendan Ryan 74, who's like an artist who makes really cool, like digital cards of hobby personalities. He says, do you think the people in the hobby take themselves too seriously? Can you explain that one and then answer it first? Cause I don't know where to go with that one. <sighs> well, maybe, maybe that's what we've been doing is just taking everything mm -hmm. too seriously. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're just, Hey, maybe we just step back and we just laugh about this and say, yeah, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I just to taking yourself too seriously is when you, you know, you, you maybe don't have, you know, maybe I don't have an ability. Hypothetically, I can't laugh at myself or, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, if somebody says something bad about me, it's, you know, it's very harmful to me. 
I'm taking myself too seriously. I'm not just I'm not relaxed. I'm not, you know, and so uh, do do we take ourselves too seriously in the hobby? Yes and no. I actually think given the stakes involved and the value of cards, we actually don't really take ourselves too seriously in a pretty admirable way. I think there's a lot of lightheartedness and fun uh, that goes on, but I think we we still do sometimes take ourselves way too seriously when, you know, somebody says something that's at odds with our interests. It can really right. fucking piss you off. I know it, it, it will I I feel that fire burn in me, you know, when someone trashes a set I like or a player that I like or something, like it will light a fire. And and maybe that's when we're at risk of taking ourselves too seriously, as an example. Yeah. I was taking it I was thinking about it in a little different direction, which I'm glad because we got two distinct answers. Mine was like <laughs> On the sort of, you know, uh, content creation side or like the individual account side, this, sh I feel like I, for me personally, I won't speak for you, but I feel like I have to come to this show specifically and bring a lot of knowledge and I have to like give very serious mm. answers that sort of guide things, you know, in the direction of positivity for the future of the hobby. And I put a lot of pressure on myself to, to come up with, you know, smart, thoughtful answers uh, to every question and, and not disregard any of them. And, you know, we've talked a lot about maybe, maybe sometimes we just don't know the fucking answer, you know, and we should make this more of a, more of a relaxed show like it has been traditionally. And maybe the last week we've got a couple of weeks, we've been too serious about it. So, that, you know, it's good. It's a good, like self-reflecting thought. Yes. And so, hey, look, sometimes it's good to just ask the question. Sometimes it's good to just pose the issue. Um, that, that's one of the ways that we can, you know, set expectations too high for ourselves is by expecting to have the answer to everything. It's, to, it's, right. it's more than okay to be, it, in fact, it's admirable in its own way to be able to say, I don't know, or let's see, I'm not quite sure right now. Especially on this like auction house thing. Cause it's like, you know, it's easy for me to say, just lower your BP and like take less money. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's the right answer for, you know, the future of the hobby. What if that like sends auction houses into a tailspin and we lose the, trust of market, but it could be like this, you know, butterfly effect thing I haven't thought of mm -hmm. and I'm in the wrong, you know? So that's a tough question. It's really hard to say like, you know, let's just make these quick snap decisions and just lower BP and make it better for collectors. It's just kind of, like you said, we're throwing the question out, we're discussing it, trying to figure out maybe there's some new angle we haven't thought of. And the chat always comes up with stuff we haven't thought of while I'm chatting. I feel like the uh, chat comes up with better solutions than I do anyways. Totally. The chat is great. All right. Uh, so <laughs> the chat says we need more Frasier talks. See, they just want more like pizza and Frasier and office jokes. <laughs> what if that's really the secret? What if like we just shifted into <laughs> discussing like friends and Frasier and food and all of a sudden our viewership is like in the thousands and people. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like we're like the, uh, you know, the rug pull of the ticket people. <laughs> yes, we, we we captivated this audience of collectors just to pivot into very low, Media. low serious dis pop culture discussions. Yeah, people are trying to like, all right, top five movies, quick, go. <laughs> <laughs> Take the bait. Yeah, all right. So back to this question from Six Cards. What is your current market outlook? If you have one, if you don't have one, you know, that's totally fine too. Well, I kind of wanted to hear your take. You gave me a little bit of a nugget last night and just in terms of, um, you know, what you're seeing in the data as far as, I'm not saying like, oh, just pick the best performing indexes and the worst. Maybe just sort of like anecdotally what you're seeing. Yeah, here's what I'm seeing for sure is cards. Um, look, I, I think that uh, despite our best efforts with our product and service and others who provide archives of sales histories that go back far in time, um, despite that, I think people who were new to the hobby didn't really have an understanding of the velocity with which certain items could potentially sell based on how many exist. I think the Brady Champ ticket is a great example of this. I think the 96 Chrome Colby Refractor is a great example of this. I think the 86 Fleer is a great example of this. I think the 03 Chrome LeBron is a great example of this. There are many other examples. I think people 
we're so bullish on cards for good reason. But the cards that were available when they were feeling super bullish in the spring, in quarter one and quarter two of 2021 in particular, the cards that were available when they were feeling so bullish are cards that seemed iconic, seemed important, but that just have too many copies and just come out too much. So people who are really high on those cards spent a fortune on them, not understanding that there were hundreds and hundreds of copies waiting in the wings that would hit the market if prices ever got so exorbitantly high like they did. And that's why you see stuff, even like a Kobe that's numbered to 150, that's why you see stuff that can go up to 250K all the way back down to 26K over an 18 month or a 19 month period. That's why you can see things like that happen because people were so freaking bullish on cards for good reason in Q1 and Q2 of 2021, but they bought the wrong damn cards at those prices. That's what it boils down to. And that's partially just because the right cards weren't available and or there wasn't an understanding and a depth of, hey, if you're breaking out a quarter of a million dollars to spend on a card, you probably want to be putting that money into a card that you can feel comfortable. One of two things is true. Either one, it's never gonna come out for sale again unless you decide to make it available. Or number two, that the other people who own that card with you, if, if, it's, a, if it's not a one of one, that those people are hardcore long-term collectors who are not gonna dump off the card as soon as they have a chance to make a 20% edge or 20% gain on it. So these were theories and approaches that had not been fully developed in early 2021 that are being fully developed now. And so that's why you can look and like the thing that we're pulling our hair out and not understanding is like, why is Trevor Lawrence's NTRPA logo man at 240K with BP on Golden right now? And it's because it's an overcorrection in that direction. Now it's like, okay, I'm so bullish on sports cards. I want to pour so much money into them because I love them. <clears throat> so the right card must be, you know, I'm sorry, I said logo man. The right card must be Trevor Lawrence's Platinum Shield 1 of 1 NTRPA. So let me just throw all the money at that one. And I, look, I can't blame people for being super bullish on cards, but, you know, we're just, and, and I think that's the closest approximation to the right place to just throw a, a dump truck full of money at. But I think there's still lots of signs that people are super bullish on cards, but that they also recognize they might have made some mistakes. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you got me fired up. Go. Um, I did it. I did a Google trend search, you know, what that is right. Like what people are searching mm -hmm. and I did it for NFTs and it was literally like a freaking triangle, like up and then down, like people cared about it and then they didn't care about it because it's basically back to where it was and sports cards. I did the same thing. And it's like, it's like a flat line. It just has like the sports card industry has so many people in it that are in it for genuine reasons where they actually love the space and it has so much history built over decades and decades that no matter what we're talking about in terms of like you know these cards going from 250k to 25k there's still so much money and so much genuine interest in this space that right now what we're seeing is just money moving around to different areas it's moving away from that specific type of card and it's moving into you know zach wilson and trevor lawrence shield cards it's moving over into collector cards and it's just like there's still so much money being spent on these cards like we're complaining about something you know, dipping across the board, but then we've got people spending 45 grand on a freaking Terry Bradshaw card. There's a $30,000 Drew Brees sale. Maybe people are just moving into prices that make more sense for them individually. Like I can't afford a 200 grand Kobe rookie anymore when there's 150 copies. Let me go buy, you know, the next step down and go get this player instead and spend 20 grand and get five cards of his. We're just seeing the hobby evolve. And I think like, the positive spin on all this is just things are changing and we just, you know, we don't know where it's going to go exactly, but I'm sure it'll be fine and recover long-term. The other thing I wanted to say off your really great rant is I don't think that this investor persona or this like fun building thing or whatever is ever going to actually like figure it out. The reason I say that is like, it took me 
six years to build my Penny Hardaway PC the way it is currently constructed. And that's because I had to, you're never going to be able to replicate exactly the card that the collector wants because it takes way too much time and effort and you actually have to care about it that much to be involved in something for six years. And you're not, you're just like, I have a million dollars I need to spend and I have six months to spend it. It's impossible to figure out exactly what collector card we are talking about because that's what people always ask us. What card are we talking about? What is the collector type of card? It's the one that takes forever to build. It's the one that keeps you here long term, takes you six, seven, ten years to build. You can't get it in six months with a million bucks. You can't just like, you know, muscle your way into a collector space. You just can't because you're trying to, you're, you're fighting too many dynamics, too many people that have been in it longer than you, too much, uh, you know, in-depth knowledge about different spaces. You can only know the super surface level basics if you're trying to spend a million dollars in six months. And that's like, what's the best rookie card of this player in the highest grade? Oh, there it is at auction. I'll buy it. You know, oh, it's going to come up again because if it was available for this auction, that means chances are it's going to be available at several auctions. Hmm. Love it. Beanor 14 sports cards had a question as a question on this topic. He goes, for those of us who are in the hobby for the long run, do you ever look at your current collection and think, if this is how big and great my PC is now after just five or six years, imagine <laughs> what it will look like 10, 20, or even 30 years from now. <laughs> That's a great like reset of everything we do. Like just think of think of that whenever you're feeling annoyed, right? Mm -hmm. Such a great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> yeah. Uh Dude, honestly, being on, um, I think for some of us, we have the collection because of the way that timing worked out. Mm -hmm. We have the collection we expected to have 20 years from now. We have it today. And it's, it's yeah. actually, um, you know, odd. <laughs> it's odd. Um, it's, it's, it's a strange place to be, but, dude, no lie. I, my collection is a uh, is a very and, and my and Christina's collection is a is you know there are collectors out there who have been doing this for so long who just like if their collection were to be put up next to mine the shadow would just cast so far over our collection that it would be humiliating. But even having said that, we love to look at our collection and take a satisfaction in how far it's come. And, uh, and, and, you know, the, I, I find myself looking back more than forward. I find myself actually yeah. just thinking about the way the collection's gotten to the point that it is and, you know, hope that it continues to get better. I've, I've never really actually sat there, at least not recently, and thought to myself, what will my collection be like 10 years from now? Have you thought yeah, that? Because you have no idea. Yeah. No, it's too far. It's far. Like, Dude, 10 years ago, I wasn't even thinking about cards, so it's just <laughs> way too far. I don't, I don't work in this, like, you know, Gary V, three, five, 10 year life outlook way. It's just like, what am I, you know, what's the next week or two? I just, I don't like to think too far ahead like that. I, I like look at my stuff, my current collection in Flickr an awkward amount of times. It's like, how many times can I look at these same pictures? And like, I really, I really enjoy my current PC. Totally. <laughs> you your showcase? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh I yeah uh, um oh damn that broke my concentration. I don't fuck I forgot I had something that amused me, but uh, okay. Great question, Vinor. Oh I don't even think uh I don't even think ten minutes in advance. You 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 know, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can attest yeah. to that. <laughs> you can attest to that. Hey, what's for dinner tonight? Christina, what's for dinner tonight? I mean, yes. yeah, pretty much. So like, but but I do think there is value in the yeah. forced exercise of saying, "What might my collection look like in ten years from now?" You know, yeah, maybe I need to do a little bit more of that thinking, uh, and it would focus some of my activity. So, oh, Dude, get to the. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I, I'm completely changing topics. Go ahead. Well, Carmen says please. that holding each card brings back memories and stories about the acquisition. It's the stories about the cards that the community wants to hear. Dude, that's I, great. Yes. I, and look, I have a mental image of the order that all my cards are stored in. 
and any card in my collection I could pick up and I could tell you the story of and it is probably very boring to anybody but to me I love picking up a card and thinking about when and where and how it was acquired wouldn't that be a like instead of your challenge of getting off social media for a week what if what if the challenge was like specific that it's some sort of hashtag challenge whatever the fuck I don't know anything about that stuff but like the challenge is uh, once a day or once a week or whatever timeline you're comfortable with, you have to pick one card in your collection and you have to either make like a video about it or a post explaining the story of how you got it, why you like it, your plan for the future of the card, whatever. Because it's like if you just picked a random card out of your PC, like McCaffrey or Luke or whatever, and you told, <laughs> reminded me of the story of how you got it, it would just be great content. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully it makes everybody think about the stories of how they got their own cards. Yeah, and they're going to pull theirs out. Like when you did the box one, I, I wanted to do the same. Yes, and that's what that's that's when content is at its purest. It's not when like you look at the content and you think, oh, how impressive this is. But instead, when you look at the content and then it makes you think about what you can do. Hello. Or it makes you think about, you know, something from your life. Like that's that's the next level of content. It's content that inspires you rather than puts you into a trance of like, oh, Go ahead, Christina. Hashtag, I'm here for the cards. Hashtag, I'm here for the cards. <laughs> well, one other, to like jump off what you said more, I get more likes on my Penny Hardaway stuff than I do my LeBron stuff. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's significantly cheaper. Same, Josh. Yeah, because it's like, people don't really care necessarily about, they care. Like, they want to see cool, expensive cards. Obviously, people want to see that. But it's more about like, your genuine connection to that card and like people know that I have more of a long-term connection to Penny than I do LeBron. So it's like they can sense that in the content. It just comes across better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Cardi C sports card says, how do you balance displaying and admiring your cards versus protecting and securing them? I know what path you take. You just choose protecting, like, all the way. All the way. All the way. If, and if I want to enjoy a card, I'll make it a whole ritual, you know. I'll, 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 bring, I'll retrieve them all. I'll bring them all out. I'll unbundle them all. You know, I'll do something, like, with it that's a task, you know. Like, I'll, you know, I'll make it into a production. Well, the longer you have to spend unwinding all of the layers of protection, the more you're going to appreciate the card when it's unsheathed. <laughs> <laughs> like finally, four hours later of pulling off all these sleeves and there it is. That's hilarious and true. Yeah, that's so What's your answer? Uh, it's that, it's like the protection. I don't do quite as much as you guys, but I do like having the layers of separation I don't care because I just like that scenario that people come up in their mind of like, oh, my friends are going to come over and like admire my wall. That never happens and it won't happen. And it's it's actually cooler if I do have a friend over, it's cooler for me to like go and like bring it to them in a box and have them like shuffle through. It just feels more like natural and organic that way anyways. It's more fun. Agreed. I, that's why I never like, yeah. that's why I never like jerseys because it's like, I have to, you're making me look at this thing on your wall. Same. I don't like the way cards present in displays on walls. <laughs> I never have. Yeah. I never have. No. Okay. Uh, also, like it, it feels like it doesn't do the card the right justice. That's what it feels like to me. But okay. Um, oh, let's see. Where do we want to go with this next? Oh, here's a great one. Jonathan Taylor cards uh, would like us to discuss Jonathan Taylor. I would be very disappointed if he didn't ask a question about Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, that's his whole topic. Uh, it's Jonathan Taylor, and I love that topic. Well, you and I, you've done this more than me. I did a little bit of it, but I've always thought like collecting cards related to like the fantasy football aspect of it is just so fun. And even if that player only has a short window of being fantasy football legend, like Antonio Brown or Le'Veon Bell, that's still a freaking great honor. To me, as a, yeah. of a player, to say like, Le'Veon Bell. Would you rather have a Le'Veon Bell collection, who is this fantasy football like legend for four years, or Joe Flacco, a quarterback? You know, like, but he won a Super Bowl. He had this amazing run, <laughs> but he's terrible at fantasy. Like, terrible at you know, like nobody drafted him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, that's a that's a great way to frame it. Um, dude, fantasy football uh, intertwining that with collecting is great for the real nerds of all nerds. You know, it's it's great for those who just conceptually want to just fucking overanalyze the hell out of shit. You know, that it's 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 tailor made for us who just wanted to. Jonathan Taylor. What's the, <laughs> it's Jonathan Taylor made. So, you know, and, and, and then in the NBA, you know, there's so many fun stats. I'm sure baseball and hockey are this way too. There's so many fun stats that you can dig into. And then, you know, collecting mixed in with that, you know, it just, it really, it, it's like this horrible harmony of a little bit of gambling and risk taking a little yeah. bit of math and analytics and analysts, analysts, you know, analyzing things, collecting pride, fandom. It just, man, it really brings all that stuff together. But I, I, I know it's not for everybody though, but I love it. It's exactly what I, I would just, The way that I think about it, especially coming from Jonathan Taylor cards, I would much rather have an amazing PC of the best running back in the NFL, Jonathan Taylor, than like, you know, uh, you know, Tua, like the 18th best quarterback, where Tua's card prices are like 20x Jonathan Taylor, but he's like the 18th best. I'd rather have the best running back in the whole Cooper Cup. I'd rather have the best receiver PC in the whole NFL. That just seems more appealing to me. And the connection that people have to fantasy football, I know for me personally at least, is so like strong. It's just there's been two decades of you know, this obsession over, like, the stats and the the connection to wanting to watch every single game and red zone and, <laughs> you know, league pass and all this stuff. And it's all because of fantasy football. And now we have cards and another, yet another outlet to obsess over fantasy football. I might have to get back into that stuff. It's, it's, it's really fun. Especially once football kicks off this year, dude, you know how much hype we're going to be about football again. Oh, yeah. I can't wait to see uh, Scott Hansen. Uh, oh, never take a bathroom break. <laughs> just going so hard, you know. It, it, you know, when the fantasy and football cards thing concept first got started, you know, th- there was at least among some a belief that like, hey, it, it, the market should follow fantasy. So like, hey, if a player does well, then their card should go up. But if they don't do well, then their card. Yeah. That's not. That wasn't yeah. the connection. That it never. Right. That that's not the connection we're looking for. The connection we're looking for is like. Oh, fantasy helps quantify the legacy building and the achievements that athletes are doing. Mm. And then that's transferable to cards because we want to own cards of athletes who are doing great things and who are building legacies and who make us become fans of them. Remember when that was a thing for like a a decent amount of time last year was like, I want to know that when I buy a guy's cards and he has a 40-point a game, that I'm going to double my money overnight. And I send it to get graded, and then I sell it, and I get rich. And it's like <laughs> fantasy football would just be a, you know, a wet dream for that scenario. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, and collecting is, is something different than that. There's a, there's a layer of that. Too, yeah. you know? if, if a right. player does well, then their cards logically should become more difficult to obtain because less people want to sell them, more people want to own them. But there's other market dynamics that come into play, you know, in terms of like, well, but people see selling opportunities when right. well. And so markets can well, I, I like the thought that you've built with the Le'Veon Bell, which is like, he's not active. I'm not prospecting. I just am collecting off of this, you know, period of time that I have nostalgia for, which was watching this guy dominate fantasy football. I think that's a, the more... That's the more logical connection to cards, in my opinion. Hmm. Right on. Okay. Uh, Investor's Hobby says, uh, exquisite football, maximum patches. That's the topic that they would like to hear discussed. I know nothing about maximum patches from exquisite football. There's a Calvin Johnson rookie. I think it's called maximum patches, but I might be wrong on that. I, uh, I don't know as much about the question asker as either. Dude. In the chat, Jamal Charles, Chris Johnson, those names just like bring a flood of like <laughs> fantasy football heaven back to my brain. Mm. Yeah. LaShawn McCoy. Oh man. He was a monster for in fantasy football for like a good three or four year stretch. Yeah. 
Did you find anything? I found eight sales in all of card letter sales history that matched. Uh, maybe he meant like, maybe he meant like just big patches in football, like the best patches. Oh, you know what? I think it's because it's called maximum patch rather than maximum uh, patches. All right, let's see. Oh, there we go. Now I have over a thousand results. Okay, so here, I'll just show you a random card. Fuck. Oh, wow. Oh, okay, that's a Jeter. We're looking for football to discuss football here. People are just naming fancy football legends in the chat. This is amazing. Dude, fancy football is awesome, man. Larry Johnson, Maurice Jones Drew, Andre Johnson, Brandon Marshall. This is great. Well, Tom Brady has some nice uh, maximum patches. Doug Martin. There's a name. Oh, man. Here we go. This is more what I'm looking for. Okay. Oh, that's exactly what I'm thinking of. That's the one I was thinking of. There's a Calvin Johnson of that. Nice. Dude, this is Marshawn Lynch. Four <laughs> of five. Maximum patches from, I, I suppose, what is this, 2007? 2007, Marshawn Lynch, <laughs> yeah. is it platinum, maximum jersey, rookie patch auto. So I'm totally ignorant to these cards. I'm learning about them literally on the fly. Dude, what a sick card, though, right? Dude, what an absolutely sick card of Marshawn Lynch. 300 bucks? 330 bucks a few weeks ago. See, this is what I'm talking about. Like, yeah, sure, this card's never going to be worth, like, two grand. So, like, it makes no sense for investors to jump on and buy these cards. But that's, like, what collectors don't think about. They don't think about that. They're just buying this card because they want it in their collection. It's just a different – it just never is going to line up, you know? Yeah. These are basically limited logos, Yeah, right? Like, these, it's the same. That must be the analog. This is a Peyton Manning maximum patch out of 30 – from 2006, exquisite. I mean, that's literally the design for the basketball limited logos. Yeah, yeah, that's that. Those are sick. Great, uh, great topic there. Okay. Um, also, there may be some investment properties to cards like that. To be honest with you, just because like one of the trends I've noticed over the last few months is like uh dude like here you know uh, this i'm i'm biased on this because i pay close attention to these stupid cards <laughs> but uh dude come on what a great endorsement these stupid cards <laughs> look you'll see what i mean look at it. this is a chris weber like 30 years after he was drafted obviously not a pioneers <laughs> card prism black all right it sold for twenty five hundred dollars. Wow! In, okay. In July, so, and, and like, dude, like that's that's not you know that's not like an invest, like, and it's still there. Okay, so it wasn't relisted. I mean, or it probably wasn't relisted. I'm just I look at some of that. I say, you know what? When Chris Weber cards are taking leaps like that, like why why not a Marshawn Lynch? Um, yeah. You know why? why <laughs> people, you know. Collectors feel this thing, man. If, if something comes on collectors' radar, because dude, think about how many people exist who were like big into c cards in the '90s and then were not involved so much in the 2000s yeah. and the in the early 2010s. Like that's so many people. I'm that's the first time I'd ever heard of that set. So I don't know. Yeah, there's always something, man. Like I need to figure out my next football player. Let's think about that. Dude, how about someone from 2000 Exquisite who has, like, sick cards like that? <laughs> like Calvin Yeah, Johnson. I mean, I'm, Calvin Johnson's my favorite. I think I need to redo my Calvin Johnson PC. He's freaking a beast. His name is literally Megatron. It's, like, one of the best nicknames ever. Who else would you be looking my other one is My other one is Todd Gurley. He was, like, when he came into the NFL, he was coming off a massive knee injury out of Georgia. But I just remember watching, like, college tape on Todd Gurley. And then when he got drafted to the Rams, I was, like, tempted 
and I did in a couple leagues. I was taking him in like the first round for his rookie <laughs> year. I was like, this dude is going to be so good. I'm telling you, like his combination of size and speed, and clearly like, you know, he broke down over time and his knees gave out. But man, he was so fucking good. He, I saw some stat that was like he still has the most touchdowns in the NFL since like 2017 or some crazy stat like that, and he's basically like missed the last two years. That's nuts. How much was that card? So this is his 2015 National Treasures NTRPA True out of 99. It's a PSA 10, which is just sick. It's just perfect. And it sold in November of 2018 for 975 bucks. And pegging it to the Todd Gurley index, it's worth about 1400 today. I still have some of the stuff. I have like his Prism Gold rookie out of 10. I think I paid like 50 bucks for that. You still have it? I think I still have, I have a binder of like football stuff, and I'm pretty sure I still have that one. And I had the top Chrome Gold rookie, but there was 50 of those. I definitely remember the Prism Gold. I remember having that one. No way, that's sick, dude. Yeah, because it was like, dude, I I was buying Todd Gurley gold cards in like 20. That must have been like 2018, I guess, 2017, and they were like so cheap. I could buy whatever I wanted. Okay, so look, this is the Gurley Rookie Prism Gold Autograph PSA 10, sold last month for 130 bucks. I mean, dude, like... That's the autograph, though. Like, the one you have is, you know, because, like, the Mahomes uh, Prism Gold Rookie Autograph PSA 10 sold for, like, 84 grand recently, and the BGS 95 True Gold sold for, like, 300. So, right. you're, you know, if your Gurley is uh, BGS Smooth, 95, bro. It's, it's probably it like a rough. 500 or $600 card. Yeah, I mean, it was raw, but yeah, I get it. Or maybe, okay, so maybe it's like 300 I don't know. It, I mean, like... Bring it dude. out. Bring that thing out, man. Break that thing. Not right now, but break it out. I, might, I will go dig through those. I know I have like a finest gold rookie and stuff. I hope I still have the, the prism. Knowing me, I still have it in the binder somewhere. But something like that. Like, you did it with Le'Veon Bell, and it's like, dude, you could build, like, the fucking best PC mm -hmm. ever of those guys for, like, you know, a few grand. All right. Well, you've led me to this, and I'm going to do this. And people are going to make fun of me. Um, but that's okay. But really just, like, got hurt. His knees, like, those running backs just, like, it just happens really fast with running backs. They get ran into the wall. So my friend Julian showed me this. Oh, this is a 2013, so it obviously is a rookie. 2013 finest autograph, super on card, one of one, Le'Veon Bell, PSA nine. On card. On card. Now this kind of <laughs> sucks. Dude, who cares? Look at that thing. <laughs> I love, I love it when that's like when it when that's like the, when the collector just like who who cares? Just look at that thing. It makes it more distinguished. Well, it's already one yeah. one, so I don't know what it's being distinct. It's better than a fucking streak or something. He just, like, he put more ink on it. What are you crying about? The seller's main picture is the card being held by a panda bear. <laughs> Did you buy it? No, no, I have not bought this yet. What do you think he's asking? Just just curious. I don't know, but that if you bought that, that would be my favorite Le'Veon Bell card that you own. It's sick. What do you think he's asking? Um... um I mean, what he's asking? If we're, <laughs> yeah, the list. Pro. He's probably asking like, he's probably asking like three K OBO. Dude, what the fuck? Just hit the bin, bro. And he's taking. Why have you bought this? Dude, I'll. Dude, I'm just gonna be completely honest. It's this. Oh come on, bro! <laughs> it's a one on one. Oh, that just kills me. I never would have said. I never even would have thought about that until you said something. But I. With the auto thing, like, it always really bothers me when there's, like, bubbling or a streak or, like, you know, they jump the pen or something. But yeah. extra, you know, like, the pen bleeds out? I don't know. That's... <laughs> and, you know... That card's fucking think, like, fire, man. Super Fractor Fire. You know how much I love Finest. You're just I giving know. me all the tingles. Dude, if it didn't have an autograph, I'd have bought it already. Yeah, I know. I know you would. Yeah, you're right. I get it. So. The chat's gonna buy it like five seconds. <laughs>
Uh, oh, Julian's still in here laughing. Yeah, Julian. You should collect a commission from this guy if it sells. On a card like that, I don't want to, like, downplay $750 because that's a lot of money. But, like, who gives a shit? You know, it's like you got a you got a one-on-one of a, like, fancy football legend. Like, what what's the problem, you know? Like, what does it matter? You just buy it. You just – it's fun. Well, here's the thing. But if the auto bothers you, I'm, just, I'm not saying, like, you should hit the bin. I'm just saying, like, if it wasn't for the auto and, and you're thinking about starting a PC and it's holding you back because of investment, who cares, man? Just buy it. I have this. That card's fucking sick. How much did you pay for that? Around 750 bucks. Let's see what I pay. The Contenders 1 of 1. Dude, that's, like, such a monster card. Like... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I lo- and I just love the way it looks and stuff, too. I love the way this Is it, like, too. shiny, too? Oh, it's super shiny, yeah. And it's, it's, got, it's like, out of, like, a black theme, and, the, and it's just, it's so nice. It's just- Dude, that's my, I, that's my favorite year of Contenders, and man, it's sick. Do you think the Panda Bear comes with it? I mean, the, one of the, my favorite parts about buying and selling sports cards is shipping it is so easy, and that Panda Bear would greatly diminish that, you know, positive. True, true. You're not, you're not crushing that into a, a flat rate envelope. You're gonna, people are buying one of one rookie autos of, you know, fantasy football legends in envelopes now. <laughs> <laughs> but doesn't that doesn't that card make you really scratch your head at people paying big money for you know Jamar Chase or you know DeAndre Swift or somebody like that? Like why would you pay when you know like inevitably they're going to turn into the prices are inevitably inevitably going to go to Todd Gurley or Le'Veon Bell levels? Yeah, I do get it. I get the uh, I get the. Um... I get, I get it on a number of levels. I get why people want something with upside and they want something to root for that they can actually root for, which is a player who's still playing and their legacy. And then number two, I get the fact that there's just more people in the market who want to buy players who are active when they're active in the market as opposed to like players who you know were active five, six, seven years ago, like Le'Veon Bell when he was in his prod. And, you know, there's just not – there's not as much hobby nostalgia for Bell. And, and I'm, I'm completely fine with that. You know, let me have, let us have these Le'Veon Bell opportunities in the hobby where we can go get contenders, one of ones and stuff for three figures. Um, but I get it. I, you know, in, in basketball, don't you think there's guys in basketball from the 80s who like watched great 80s players and they're like, why is that Grant Hill? worth more than my Alex English, you know? I mean, yeah. that probably exists too, but we get it, you know, because we came up in the 90s, you know, so, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm speaking to the guy who's spending more on the McCaffrey's than the Bells by, you know, exponential numbers. True. True. And I bought Mikhail Bridges, like, you know, I get it. True. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh... Oh, South Park card says, ask Josh if he knows Candace. Knows what? Ask Josh if he knows Candace. Candace? Nope. Is this some sort of inside joke I'm not a part of? No, it's one of those D's. Oh, who's Candace? <laughs> the punchline is, Candace dick fit in your mouth. <laughs> that's good. Dude, you know, I'm always the one that's like trying to bait the person to go ahead and say the thing. No, I know. You Dude, why not? I know, I know. What's the worst that could happen? It's like you're going to make some joke about my, you know, my balls and your dick in my mouth or something. Well, that one was just for South. So uh, I <laughs> think. The D's one is my favorite. It's just so like quick and obvious. It's like you just, <laughs> nobody's actually falling for it. True. Once in a while. That reminds me. Oh, no. I knew it was coming, and I didn't look away from the camera. Damn it. All right. Uh, This came in from Pat Nicholson. 
He says best. They're telling you. They're telling me to refresh that finest bell real quick on camera. People are saying to refresh that page. Well, <laughs> did it? I don't think it sold. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go on. Oh. <laughs> <Be alert. laughs> Let's go. <laughs> dude, you're gonna get a. D you know what's gonna happen, dude? You're gonna get a DM. It's like thousand bucks, motherfucker. <laughs> Dude, you want to talk about you want to talk about influencer of the year? Can I get some votes for just selling everybody on buying that thing right now? <laughs> oh, that's too funny. That's hilarious, dude. The guy who owns that card is like, "What the hell? That card's been up for three years. Now someone buys it. Can I put the panda on there?" <laughs> yeah, the panda better be the panda better come with it. That's all I have to say. Are you like totally fucking mad now? What do you mean? My contenders is worth eight million dollars now. <laughs> oh, look at this! Pandas cards presents. When you see the panda, you know the deal is grand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like KMC just in the chat. I think you're low key, like pretty pissed right now. No, that's not why I'm not showing my face. That's Dang. that's you're... why I'm not. That's why I'm refusing to turn the camera around. Christina, what's his uh, level of red in his face right now? What are we talking? I got a big sunburn um, since we started looking at this. <laughs> you, we ran outside in the dark. You know, the mood is bright out here. We're so far south. American Airlines has, like, strobe lights in your room. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, great. That really worked out. Dude, get to the question about Jersey retirement because I oh. want to jump up back on that rant. All right, let's go. This question is from Vinny Slabarino, one of our favorites. Vinny Wait, read all of no. it. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we have an early entry for emoji caption, Panda. Mmm. When you see the panda, you know the deal is grand. <laughs> <laughs> Granda sounds like a, well, that's Donda or whatever. Isn't that the album, the Kanye album or whatever? Mm, Donda, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, Vinny Slavery, <laughs> uh, edited for time, says, do you think the bar is relative for NBA jersey numbered retirements? <clears throat> Excuse me. The Lakers are retiring Gasol's number 16. That's an insult to guys like Kareem and Magic. But the Grizzlies retiring Zach Randolph's number, a player similar in skill to Gasol, makes sense because he meant a lot to the Grizzlies franchise, maybe more than anyone else before Ja Morant. Dude, I'm not even going to like pretend to try to answer that question because I don't think any jersey should be retired ever in any sport. End it all. Bring all the jerseys back. It's over. I think it's a scam. <laughs> oh, it's a scam. <laughs> Woo! Dude, how Gasol played for the Lakers for like five years. How is that a thing? How is this jersey being retired by the Lakers? And also, he freaking, let's be honest, Kobe Bryant was the leader of that team. Why is Pau Gasol getting his jersey retired off of that? He was more a Grizzly than he was a Laker. Damn, he, he makes some good points. So what's going on there? What's up with that? Lame, bro. I don't know. It's lame. What do you want me to say? It's just lame. It's just backfiring. So they so they haven't retired Magic Johnson's number? Of course they have, right? 32? They definitely have. Oh. I think he was saying, like, it's an insult to those guys because... Oh, who had their jersey numbers retired? Yeah, their name is, like, next to that. You know, like, relatively speaking, it's kind of a joke. Mm-hmm. Okay. I guess that Gasol was like important to the history. They probably don't win two rings without Gasol. I get all that. But there's a difference between like being an important piece on a team versus like you have your jersey retired and in the rafters and nobody can wear that number and your name is next to Kareem of Village Bar. Big difference. <laughs> like the bar is way too low. Dude, Zach Randolph. What? Is he even like a top 200 player of all time? Top 300? Like what are we talking about here? That's a great question. I did enjoy Zach Randolph, though. I liked watching him play. Okay, then answer the question, then, more directly. 
I don't know. I, I, I doubt it. I highly doubt it. The question wasn't, is, was Zach Randolph a neat player? It was, should, oh, should we be retiring his jersey number? Oh, I like your solution. Let's just stop retiring jerseys and let's retroactively unretire all jerseys. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Unretire these fucking numbers. Dude, these guys will get over it quick. They, they are fine. Michael Jordan, unretired. LeBron, never getting your number retired. Too bad, guys. Do we have like a new hashtag? Movement development here. Hashtag unretire those numbers. Hashtag never I got, retire. <laughs> I got some pretty like, you know, some DMs of like, how dare you, you know, say that like these guys shouldn't have their their legends. Like, I'm not arguing that. I just think this whole, I think this very specific act of the jersey retirement is silly. Mm. I don't even know why. Look, that's just a fair take. That's that shouldn't be a polarizing. <clears throat> like, what if what are people like? really wrapped up in the ritual of the jersey retirement ceremony? I don't know. Well, it's similar to me posting a Kobe card going down 75%, and they, that being taken as, like, I don't like Kobe. 89%. <laughs> it's like, that's like me saying, I don't like Kobe. It's like, I never said that. I just said this card went down a lot, and it was justified. It's, a, it's like, mm -hmm. we're talking about two different things. Yeah, and then on that no, it's not an indictment of the card. It's exactly. an indictment of our silly market that's still learning and, I don't know, finding its way. You know, do, my other favorite... Well, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I would, no, go ahead. no my, my other favorite one is, like, when I post the picture of, like, the Topps Chrome LeBron going from 40 grand down to... Or, did it get to 50 or whatever? Down to seven. And people are like, yeah, it's because of his stupid <laughs> tweets about politics. And I'm like, oh, my God, what? It's because of the supply and, like, all this market dynamics. There's nothing to do with this. <laughs> well, actually, do you know why Curry's RPAs have gone from uh, 750 to, to 450 to 500, even though he won the championship? Because uh, he bought into NFTs and crypto. That is. That's one of my agendas that I'm going to use that data point to support. And then also, I think people just hate this. People just hate, <laughs> people hate that. Like... <laughs> and that's why his card market's going down. People are I voting you're piling, their dollars. You're piling on to the silliness of this troll. I like it. <laughs> I'm here for it. I'm, I'm always in the spirit of piling on. <laughs> you're, just, you're the guy that jumps in at the very end and just... And you stop piling on when things are actually doing, like when NFTs are doing bad. You're like, it's enough, oh. guys. Like, yeah, that's not true. Pile on. I don't even think about NFTs anymore, to be honest with you. Like, I was like, has anything ever gone down more than this 89% loss of this card? And Josh was like, yeah, dude, NFTs. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're right. I forgot about those. <laughs> but isn't that the ultimate disc that you forgot they existed? I guess it is. They did. They never did exist. That was the point. <laughs> Uh, Julian in the chat says, why does it matter that some numbers aren't available? Let's unpack that. I'm the guy that also is like, you know that there's like 32 teams in the NFL and it's like perfectly organized. There's four in every division. It's like super symmetrical and beautiful. We have 16 games. When they added the 17th game, I was the one that's like, this is so annoying because you're ruining the symmetry and the stats. It's the same with the jersey retirement. Like, I have to think about all these weird extra things. I just want to pick my favorite jersey number on my favorite team. I don't want to have to think about all these weird, stupid, made-up rules of, like, jersey retirement for specific situations. Well said. Also, don't worry about Julian. He's a guy who uses the verb unpack metaphorically, and he's not talking about a suitcase. <laughs> Julian is part of the coastal elites, and uh, there's nothing we can do about it. So let's unpack that. <laughs> All right. I've been doing a lot of unpacking this week, literally, not yeah. figuratively. Yes, I have. I've been doing a lot of unpacking. You took a three hour walk around our new neighborhood <laughs> while I set up the house. That's for safety reasons, Christina. He's thinking about canvassing for security reasons. This is smart. Exactly. Exactly. He sent me pictures of the Chipotle that's a block away. <laughs> yeah, I knew. I I thought of you, Josh, when I saw that Chipotle as well. 
Let's go. <laughs> the odds of me making a trip out there just increase drastically. I, I know. I didn't want to give you too much FOMO all at once. Oh, look at well, that. You, you're like, Sorry, go ahead. You're like, we're here. Come hang out with us. There's season tickets. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Where's the nearest Chipotle? <laughs> it's very close. Kobe, 81, 23, 1996, 13 says, Hoj can unpack these nuts. <laughs> that's the comment of the night. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. You, said, you, that said, that, uh, you said that moving was horrible, right? Oh. It's not as fun as when we were in college. Is that true? It is true. It is very, very true. Well, the chat has noticed your major upgrade in terms of internet speeds. Mm, yeah, my, people say, people are like, oh, did uh, his camera got clear? Like the same phone. I don't get how that's a good thing, but we'll go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. Everyone's just, <laughs> what, the crossover viewership's about to like start tanking now. <laughs> the meme's like, well, way that's too why. Close, way too close. That's probably why you had to get the fresh cut for tonight, because otherwise we'd just be seeing every little, you know, loose hair. I got the fresh cut so that at least when I first showed up this building, people didn't think I was homeless. <laughs> well, did you wear socks today? Yes, I did. Oh, but funny story. They were super low angle socks. Because they were mine. Oh. And after I had been wearing them in my sandals for like half of my walk, they just kept falling off of my heel. And so I just took them off and I threw them away. You what? I have to, I just found a great, like, Christmas birthday idea for you. It's fucking socks. <laughs> well, I had socks on then. I have socks on now. It gets cold in this living room, main room, so. Isn't Dallas going to be warmer than where you guys came from? Yes. Dallas was in the 90s today, which I'm told is Dallas is experiencing a cold front. But uh, it's it's really cold because you cause everybody cranks up the AC, and so yeah, it's really cold. Like, but it has to get so cold in this main room for it to be like moderately cold in the bedrooms. So it's just it's it's a mm. is this a newer building? Do we know how old this building is? It is. It's got to be new. I don't know how new. It's new. It's got it's got to be very new. This Texas always has like you know, newest, new and bigger and better and more efficient air conditioning units. Like, everything's got to be perfect for the customer. We do have a nest. Yeah, I was going to say, to be fair, we have a nest, but I haven't mastered it yet. I'm still trying to hook it up to my iPad to, like, figure it out. So it could be that it's just cooling the living room and not the bedrooms right now. Well, you know, call your boy. I'll help you out. I've had a nest for 10 years. Let's go. Ooh. Well, uh, I'm really bad, as you know, at describing what's going on wrong uh, with technology. Can you just Fact. come and fix it for me? <laughs> these, are, these are all great tactics to get me out there. <laughs> smart. We got Chipotle. Okay. Here, I wanted to read this question from C. Keat. He's been in the chat all night. He sent a question. <laughs> He said, what card has the greatest gap between BGS 9.5 and PSA 10 in price? The 1993 SP Foil Jeter seems like a front runner. BGS 9.5 goes for about 10 grand. PSA 10 goes for 275 grand. That's a 27X. And that PSA 10 just came down. That card was over half a million. Yeah, yeah. That's got to be the winner, right? It's got to be. It's that's, in fairness, the BGS nine five is a pop three hundred, and the PSA ten is a pop twenty one, so that's worth noting. BGS nine five. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously got to be a card where it's like incredibly difficult to get the PSA ten. <laughs> it's got to be relatively high pop, you know, to have enough cards to be able to mm -hmm. make that more difficult and increase that gap. Right. I mean, the Jordan Clear, right, is a pretty big gap. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Jordan Fleer gap is, is huge as well. Like, uh, and with Jordan Fleer, it really depends on what the subgrades are, but like, the, it's, the difference today is maybe like 40 to 50 for a min sub 9.5, and then PSA 10 is 200. So, but, but that's not, that, 
the Jeter foil gap is just mind boggling. And it's not just the it's not just the PSA ten and the BGS nine five. PSA nine to BGS nine, BGS eight to yeah. PSA eight. It's across all the grades for that card. I think the Jeter is the winner though. That just seems I, I've like heard that I've heard of that before. Like I knew it, I didn't know it was that insane, but I, I definitely like that one definitely stands out. Yes. Um <clears throat> A lot of good questions that we didn't get to. <laughs> well, it's rapid fire. Oh my god! All right. Uh, <laughs> Your favorite phrase ever. Let's rapid fire. <laughs> uh, Nicholas Ledner says, "When should you accept an offer on eBay, and when should you counter?" Hmm. Like when not to be too greedy, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's like, depending on the amount of activity, activity you have, if you've got like a decent number of offers, you should just, you should always counter everybody and one of them will accept. But if you've had your listing up for a month and you, this is your first one that you're happy with, just take it. Fair. But I know some people just say always counter, right? <laughs> That's what, uh, someone's burner said. <laughs> I love the haircut in that burner picture. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh. Pack Nicholson says, best to offer etiquette. So another question about offers. Isn't it assumed when a listing has a best offer that they're actually willing to negotiate? I understand someone straight up declining a lowball offer, but I find it frustrating when I'll offer somebody equal to or above current market value and they still decline it and they don't send a counter offer. I totally get that it's up to them, but I'm curious, what do you guys think about best offers from both the buyer and the sell and the seller standpoint, should you have best offer on if you're not gonna freaking, you know, offer no. and counter offer reasonably? No. Christina says no. I need more than that. No, because because it's freaking frustrating. Like you cannot negotiate if you're not gonna negotiate, then don't open up negotiations. Be like, this is the flat rate price. Amen. Yeah, I I want them. To, I remember when Will, the autograph guy, used to post screenshots of like the card best offer fifteen, and he would offer fourteen, and they would decline it. <laughs> yes. Yep. Stuff like that. Yeah. Well, look, it is silly, and here's why: if you have a card that you're selling for five hundred dollars, you have offers turned on, and an offer of four hundred and seventy-five dollars comes in, and you say no. First of all, the person who sent the offer is going to be pissed off and they're not going to want to buy that card from you or any more cards from you. And yep. it was over $25. But I also turned the tables and I asked the buyer, if you were willing to go to 475 why don't you just pay the 500 <laughs> It's a psychological thing. I do the same thing. It's like, if you had put the bin at 475, I would offer you 450. <laughs> you just like psychologically have to be the last one to put in, you know. And so if sellers are really operating their big brains, their their giant galaxy brains, just put the card a little bit above what you want, <laughs> turn offers on, and let the buyer feel like they got a deal. <laughs> free tips? You said you weren't gonna oh give these out. I'm tired of giving you foolishly free tips. No more free tips on this show. That's a big brain move right there. Yeah. Well, also, just isn't that what, like, JCPenney does, too? They raise their prices a month before they do a big, like, seasonal special. So, like, oh. JCPenney? Yeah. Is that where you shop, Chris? Dude, JCPenney is much higher class than where I, where I shop. <laughs> I, I, dude, I'm, I'm that guy who buys that NASA shirt from Walmart. And <laughs> <laughs> I think I made the comment to you at some point when we were in person at the hotel or something like there's this like style that exists where you dress to like look like you don't care you know it's like it's like hipster kind of vibe mm -hmm. but you have this like I actually don't <laughs> care and that's what I wear <laughs> yes yep I am what these hipsters aspire to be exactly you're just like you're like the meta hipster where it's like you just wish you could be this hipster as me <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. It's a vibe. It's a mindset. It's not even like a, it's not an intentional thing. Facts. Okay. Mad City Collector says, do you have any custom indexes on your card letter profiles that are not publicly visible to the users? That are not publicly visible? Yeah, you made your own custom index that nobody else can see. Yes. I have mine. It's been running for a while. LeBron Prism Silvers. I just want to know that market is like the Prism Silver market has dipped a lot and I kind of combined it with LeBron. Yeah. I don't I just keep an eye on that one. It's down a ton. Yep. Totally. You? No, none. None. Christina, do you have a custom index? Um so technically yes, but Remember, this is rapid fire. Yeah, technically yes, but it's not really my custom index. It was an index that I made to take screenshots to teach someone how to make an index. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, well, what would we have to change about custom indexes for you to use it more? Me? Yeah. I use it all the time. I just don't keep the indexes. Okay, that was okay. That's the distinction. Yeah. So I've, keep, I've kept mine until I'm ready to make a new one. No, I just like to play with it for a little while and then just get rid of it. Yeah, that's kind of why I did one at a time. I just didn't feel like keeping it long term mattered as much, but maybe it does. <laughs> A fat sex, you need to chill, bro, before I come over there. You think I'm in Dallas, so I can't come to you, but what if I'm not? I just, I just love that you and I have been, like, sidetracking so many times tonight. She sidetracks once, and you're like, let's go. Keep it, <laughs> it wasn't even a sidetrack, though. It was, a, it was like, me expressing <clears throat> the answer in more than yes or no. Look. And the previous question that I answered when I just said no, both of you were like, I'm gonna need you to expand upon that. Look, look I know when she, <laughs> when she's like, like when she opens, when her opening salvo is well, technically the answer is, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know what, more free notes for everybody. If you wanna know how to treat a woman in the hobby, this is how you do it. You treat them like one of the group and you razz on them Let's and go. you let them, you let them engage at their own level and you just go with it. Yep. Is that right? Because she's gonna clap back at both of you anyway. Cause she will fucking chop, she'll bite your head off. <laughs> the tomato response. Yeah, I see you, Jordan. All right, that's all right. That's all right, I got you. Jordan, tell them about you know, what I got you with that uh, Dissenta joke on Clubhouse. Jordan was like, oh, you're never going to get me. And I just, oh, I, well, I'll, I'll let him tell the story in the chat. Just go ahead, Jordan, put that in there. Tell him about Dissenta. Well, we've, we've always got something over the Clubhouse group. We dominated that freaking basketball tournament, so we've always got something. Oh, dude, we need. That wasn't a tournament. That was a fucking massacre. We <laughs> we need to run it back. Oh, there's a there's a court that's walking distance from the complex, which pleases me quite a bit. Let's get some shots up. Oh, I'm probably gonna go tomorrow, and then you'll I'll I will be red as a tomato uh, <laughs> next Friday. So <laughs> okay, all right. It's an outdoor court. It is outdoor. So there you go. What are you doing? See, Keen, you, you, why are you always talking shit, man? He is, man. He's, like, very part of this chat. He loves getting in there and <laughs> mixing it up. Yeah. When I, after we read his question about the, um, the Jeter foil, which is a, a, an accurate observation. He didn't like the answer. Yeah, he goes, he goes, well, he goes, pop is 14x higher, price is twice that. Anyways, thanks for reading the question. Okay, guy. All right. Sometimes people ask questions with like the answer that they want to get out of it, and then when they don't hear it, they get mad. We ain't real hoopers, dude. This guy is like we coming will, at us. We will cook you. We will destroy you. Come, come. You tell me when you're in Dallas. You will get, you will get shredded. <laughs> He's seeking this heat. <laughs> You will get shredded by uh, by the poor man's Boris Dio. <laughs> Mohammed is right. <laughs> oh, thank you. you. I was he did say thank you. He's right. He did say thank you. Oh, so he can he can dish it, but he can't take it. That's all right. Let's. I'll see him on the court. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you at? 
He says he ain't going nowhere. Come to Seattle. He won't. <laughs> He's ready, man. You think I won't come to Seattle? <laughs> <laughs> Who's your partner? Who's your two for your two for this two on two? Yeah, we'll see. All right. Oh, hopefully it's in Seattle. Hopefully it's like Ray Allen or something. <laughs> oh, Green Lake Park. All right, hold on. <laughs> oh, he plays full court, Chris. He says get your cardio up. We got, oh, but you can't read that. All right, look. Every man thing spells full court, five on five. Here we go. Here, just for you. <laughs> Is he be looking at plane tickets tomorrow? And we're, we're putting your name in, in quotes because we don't really believe that. That's just... He's got the dot. Don't forget the dot. There you go. Oh, look at my other notes. Oh, see? I told you, man. You've got to start keeping track of these captions. That's my notes from today's show. Beautiful. Okay. All right, back to the rapid fire. <laughs> yeah, so much for rapid fire. All right, back to the rapid fire. Christina. All right. Damn, someone someone just volunteered to be a second. You got, the chat's taking nice. up against you. Nice. Send me a Not little a video. Girl. Thanks, Chris. Send me, send me a little video you ball and see, Kate. Oh, he's talking big shit. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he's like always in the chat. He's a uh, he's always active in this yeah, chat. I love he, it. He's got good comments. I I like what he brings. He keeps he keeps the edge up. He's seeking the heat. Yeah. Send me a little video of you hooping so I should know if I even need to practice or not. But you have a cell phone. You can take a video. Come on. Oh, now we're going with this. All right. All right. All right. Come on. Right, and then you're all like excited about this. Uh, <laughs> peace be the journey. <laughs> he said I don't fly across the country with a camera. <laughs> <laughs> Just put your phone on the ground. <laughs> You ever filmed yourself <laughs> shooting around? Okay. Peace be the journey says, please discuss. Oh, you have you ever filmed yourself shooting around? Uh, no. It's, I stopped doing it just because I watched myself shoot around. I was like, damn, I'm so slow. My form is trash. Oh, this, I, I actually, I advise against filming yourself. In undergrad, we used to go to the gym and he used to make me sit there and film him while he would take his shots. <laughs> I don't know, that video that Nick had made, I've probably seen that thing about 50 times by now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Peace Be the Journey says, please discuss the rise of raw cards. Can you turn the fan back on? Please, please. please. The, the rise? The rise of raw cards. <laughs> has that happened? I don't know. Discuss it. Or is that your discussion? Oh. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I would love to see more people focus on raw cards and binder building because I think that's fun. Okay. All right. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on graded cards, though. Like, so we don't really pay attention or, or like get into the raw side of it too much. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, there he is. I knew Carbon was going. Carbon's favorite grading company is R.A.W. <laughs> <laughs> It's got to be a three-letter acronym, doesn't it? What does it stand for? Uh, Spell it. Really awesome. Wax. Wax. <laughs> there you go. There it is. Grading company, R.A. <laughs> He's ready for that one. He was ready. He's like, someone asked you about Raw. I'm fucking dropping this. Dude, I know all Carbon stuff. Carbon uh, went on a nice rant on clubhouse the other day <laughs> and I already knew it was coming. He goes, there's two principles. And I said, I know what those principles are. Number one, never FOMO. Number two, never YOLO. That's all you need to know. Never, never YOLO. What does that mean? Never YOLO. Never. You only live once. Except we literally just moved to Dallas. Except we totally just YOLO. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, raw cards are awesome, though. Just to throwing that out there. Um, oh, all right. This is from Mostly 90s Basketball Cards. He says, a hobby wizard 
hands you an envelope. That was fun. <laughs> In, inside the envelope is the location of the 2018 Black Prism Luca one of one. If you open the envelope and read the location, you are never allowed to tell anyone, you are never allowed to benefit from the information, and you're never allowed to own the card. Do you open the envelope? For me, the answer is yes, because that's never that's a card I'll never be able to own anyway, so I might as well know who has it. All right. Does anybody else want to take a stab at it, convert it into their grail of all grails? No, this is your fucking card. Hurry up. Well, that's it. That's all I got. You didn't even say anything. Yeah, I did. I said I would open it. Oh, you would read it? Yeah, I would read it. Oh. And you can't tell anyone about what you read? Yeah, that's fine. What's the penalty you if can't I buy slip it. up? Yeah. Well, on my grail card, I wouldn't open it because I actually want to buy mine. Yeah, yeah same. Fair. Okay. Or, there like, you go. I want to maybe one day rip it. Like, pull it. Oh. Like, rip, like, rip the box and mm. pull it. Oh, well that, that's an issue. What if the envelope says the card is in a box in a warehouse in Seattle? <laughs> like, it hasn't been opened yet. Like, it hasn't come out of its box. Yet. What if you open the envelope, spousal privilege says that you can tell me without us admitting it to anyone that you've ever told me, and then I go and retrieve the card, therefore I own the card, and you do not own the card, and we just... Ruined David's hypothetical. So, like, when we were in undergrad together, we had a professor who would tell Christina, don't fight the hypothetical. <laughs> don't fight the question. Don't try to make a rule that breaks the question. Just answer the spirit of the question. No. All right. Uh, Mike Pinkerton 50 says, will the Burbank show evolve into the National West? I don't know. Isn't this the first one? We have no idea yet. This is the let it, let, it, let it evolve. Let's see what it is first. I mean, it, it's shaping up to be a big time show. And there were, like, I really like the way that their social media account is marketing, like, their committed vendors or whatever. Like, here's some of their committed vendors most recently announced. <laughs> it's like committed here is Axe, uh, Body Spray. Uh, Planet Fitness is a committed vendor. Colgate, of course. The dentist. IRS. Uh, <laughs> Vegas Dave. You know, you know, he's got to be there with his Derek Carr collection. And yeah, the IRS will be. Their booth is up here next to Vegas Dave's booth. Uh, in between Vegas Dave and Planet Fitness will be the IRS. So. Yeah, I was hoping to see like what cards are going to be there, like. I get there's a bunch of businesses, but this I don't even know what dealers or cards are going to be there. Right. Yep. Uh, we are not going. You're not going. I'm not going, correct? Correct. Okay. Kellen Mond? Yeah, that's like a meme right now, right? People are trying to make him a thing. Dude, I, I had never seen him play. I went and read a little article about him and like, the coach was like, well, he's better than he – when he showed up at training camp, that's for sure. And Like, Kirk Cousins was like, yeah, he played pretty well, you know. Like, I guess leadership in the Vikings organization has said that they want Cousins. He's definitely the starter. <laughs> like, there's no quarterback controversy there at all. He's a backup. I just – I'm not – but, you know. That was the first I'd ever even looked into him, and but I, <laughs> I was not particularly impressed by what I found. Dude, Kirk Cousins is low key like one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. Like, go look up that dude's stats. He had seven interceptions last year. The only person even close to that was Aaron Rodgers. Just saying. You guys can hate on Kirk Cousins all you want. That dude is good. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's very good. Okay. Uh, He's also a model of consistency, and he plays every game. He's a, he's good. Dave Man seventy nine says, uh, please discuss vintage rookie card autographs. Hmm. Yeah, this has never really been our thing. I know it's kind of picking up steam lately, and there's a few accounts that are focused on it. Sasha P Cards has a really great collection of them. If you want to learn more about it, he also. Uh, dissects those sales in the big auction houses. So if you want to learn more about it, yep. check out his account. 
Yep. Great recommendation. Oh, I want to, I'm not, I'm just not going to do it. Just, I'm, I, but I am trying to find, there was like a hype here, here, here we go. So a, one of these sold very strong in the last auction. The Russell? Uh, no, Jackie Robinson. Oh, I mean, that's freaking, what a sick auto. So this is a 1949 Bowman PSA oh. authentic autograph grade nine. Jackie Robinson. Jeez, man. Look at that. What did it sell for? You want to guess? Oh, um, God, dude, I, this is going to be so hard. Like, Five hundred grand or something? I have no idea. Ninety-six grand. I mean, I don't know shit about that. So, like, people vastly, you know, prefer the high grade unautographed. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. So, uh, just a little shout out there to vintage rookie card autographs. Vintage is a very different structurally from modern cards. You just really just, in many cases, just have one solo rookie card. You know, so. The autograph yeah. is almost like a variation or something like that. Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge fan of in-person autographs insofar as they belong to the same category of sports cards. To me, I think they verge yeah. heavily into becoming memorabilia items at that point, but we'll save that for another day. Congrats. I think that's, a, that's probably a pretty big and important sale. And as Josh said, the market for those has been strong lately for sure uh in the chat digs underscore cardboard said could kirk cousins win the super bowl though <sighs> only one team wins the super bowl out of 32 and i have the same issue with basketball where like it's this all or nothing mentality if you're not a if you're not a top two player in the league you know your cards are worthless kind of thing i get it like i get why people think that way i just kind of wish we could give more props to the the people who are really, really, really good at something and consistent, they're just not, you know, they're just not like the top. I, I don't know. I'm not saying Kirk Cousins deserves that necessarily, but, you know, I'm thinking of like, um, you know, like uh, Aaron Rodgers, Tim Duncan, Chris Paul, the guys who like aren't quite the top tier of players of cards, but have like stellar resumes. Oh, yeah. Well, I just threw Kirk Cousins into car letter sales history. His most expensive card ever was $1,400 four years. Holy shit. Four years. Less than Kellen, less than Kellen Mond, I bet. Yeah. Kellen Mond's, let's see what Kellen Mond's is. Kellen Mond's. Kellen Mond's highest sale in card letter was his 2021 NT uh, out of five. And it is a horizontal card. Is that is this, is this like the throwback or something? I'm not quite sure which. Yeah, it's like a remake of the 2012 yeah, design. So this is a remix. This isn't his true. Our what's the price, guy? The price was six grand. <laughs> this is like four or five x the freaking Kirk Cousins. That's ridiculous. And then here's uh oh okay here's an out of five for Kellen Mond. This is the true RPA design, which I don't really love because like the purple of the jersey just like blends into this purple. But uh, yeah, a little either. BJS eight five auto ten sold for four grand a few days ago. Okay, and then I like let's see what the most expensive. Kirk Cousins card is on eBay right now. Okay, <laughs> it's his 2012 Prism autograph out of 99 BGS 1010. Then his 2012 Prism Gold is up for 12 grand, and then you start dropping off a ton. Oh, this is a Tua card. God, why? I hate this. Oh my god. Oh great, uh, used the used clothing. Uh, there's the famous Black Rose who owns like a ton of high end football guys and just lists their cards at like 10x their value. It's like a thing. <laughs> well, here's a one. Of, yep, so, one of his he has is this NT one of one sticker autograph. Okay, all right. Moving on. 
Uh, oh boy. All right. We're going to wrap this thing up in three minutes. Um, let's just, let's just get like one or two last ones in here. Oh, damn. I really wanted to get to this. This was a question from Drake's PC. Mm. Damn. Good now. All right. Do it. Drake's PC says there's been a lot of discussion around influencers lately. Is there a card or type of card that you bought because somebody else told you or they had influence over you somehow? Is that card still in your collection? For me, it was gold refractors. When I returned to the hobby, that was not one of the first cards that I bought, but now it's mostly what I do buy. Man, this is like philosophy class up in here today. <laughs> Dude, people were very pensive and thoughtful today and upset and myth. myth but yeah. The, basically, the, the topic goes towards, you know, aren't we all sort of influenced at some level mm -hmm. on every card purchase? You know, whether we heard about it <laughs> uh, from a friend or online or whatever, we're always, you know, sort of influenced to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we all take influence from somewhere and, uh, and inspiration. And even, uh, you know, but let's take it even a step further. Is there such thing as an original thought? Wasn't it Newton who said, uh, I merely stand on the shoulders of giants? Who said that? The shoulders of giants. Isn't that Winston Churchill? Standing on the shoulders of giants was said by Isaac Newton, he, who said in a letter to Robert Hooke in 1675, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, so like, the, then the question is like, you know, why are we complaining about influencers so much if we've been influenced to buy cards? Oh, I mean, that, the distinction there is an influencer by definition is somebody who influences people to purchase things as the end goal. An influencer exists to drive people to buy a product because they're a trusted authority. Whereas a non-influencer or a collector is somebody who is charting a path forward with their own collection. They are not there to urge or encourage or discourage you from doing what they're doing. They're not operating or existing with the intention of moving you in one direction or another because they're influential or powerful. They are simply existing there, showcasing what they've done and why, and then allowing you to elect, you know, hey, I like something that they're doing or I don't. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're, at no point is their mission to control or direct or influence the behavior of others in the direction of driving them to buy a product for this for that specific purpose so you know to me like i've taken great inspiration from collectors that i really admire and or who i think um you know have a great uh sense of taste and collection ability. right so it's like influence first inspiration boom that's a great way to distill it and i'm glad we got to that question from drake all right, this was a two and a half hour special for the, the this first night from Dallas. When does the NBA season start? Is that, is that soon? It's usually like end of October. Oh, yeah. October 17th, the Mavs played Phoenix Suns in Phoenix. Mm. Mm. Okay. Engaged. When's our first home game? God, so I have to, we have to be here for two months with no games? <laughs> Realization <laughs> setting in, bub. We have the industry summit in between. We do have the industry summit coming the up. The first home game, which is the first real game of the season, is October 22nd. October 22nd. Okay. And uh, we are going to the Cowboys-Buccaneers game. Yeah, it's a cover of uh, to watch Brady. 
He better be playing. You're going to root for the, root for the Cowboys at the uh, Jerry Dome or Jerry's World, whatever. <laughs> the Jerry Dome. All right, what do we call in this episode? Is this going to be a, a shout-out to the Panda? If When you see the Panda, the deal is Granda? Got to be. I like it. Nothing else really jumped out. No. Nope. No, it didn't. Okay. That'll do it. Are we taking a week off, or are we going for the posting stories of our cards thing? Oh. Totally post cards with stories. I'm going to start light. I'm probably going to just, like, maybe I'm just going to completely avoid stories and my feed and only do DMs. But the problem is people send stories and feed posts that they're making fun of to DMs. Which is okay. That's in the bounds of legalities. Yeah, but you know what I'm going to do? At some point over the next seven days, I'm going to take 24 hours off of any hobby-related social media. I think that might be tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah. I think so. Saturday feels like a day where I'm just going to leave my phone away. and. Fair. Although there is a, an, a golden auction ending tomorrow night. Yeah. <laughs> That's on social media, though. We can't stay away, can we? No, it's we're too deep, man. Too many tentacles. <laughs> we're just. I wish we could get rid of the ads, dude. How much better would Instagram be without ads? Someone come up with a way to. You know what's gonna happen? Those guys are gonna come out with a. Oh, you want to pay five bucks a month for fucking no ads? Like, and everyone's gonna do it. There's a free idea for you, Instagram. You want some free revenue? There you go. <laughs> I'd probably do it, to be honest. A lot has changed since Card Ladder began. We started with 500 cards in our database, and now we have over 3 million cards and over 30 million sales. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. With Card Ladder's sales history feature, we have virtually every card in our system. If the card you are looking for ever sold on one of these platforms, you can find it using Card Ladder's sales history. And you can add a card to your collection with just one click. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Plus, every card, no matter the last time it sold, has an estimated value that we calculated using our state-of-the-art player indexes. Unlike other apps, when you see Card Ladder's verified check mark, that means a researcher personally vetted each and every sale. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. We know what you want because Card Ladder was created by collectors for collectors. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Join the innovators, not the imitators. Card Ladder 2.0, constantly innovating. Try it for free. See why Card Ladder is the industry leader in sports card data. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Card Ladder 2.0.